again, everybody, and welcome to another exciting episode of the Jim Cornette Experience, beaming to you from the peace and love capital of the world, the United States of America. And today on the program, SummerSlam, stupid people, and some good stuff in the middle. Because I'm cranky today, and we don't know what will happen. And to join me in figuring out what's going to happen, Hawaiian Brian, the podcasting lion, the king of the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network, Mr. Co-host to you, he is that man that walked that barbed wire fence 32,000 miles barefooted, eat steel wool like cake, sopped lightning with bread, picked up Plymouth Rock, and caught nine pounds of buckshot. Your friend and his, the great Brian Last. Aloha, Jim. A pleasure to be here once again. I appreciate all the very kind comments you had there. Reminded <sighs> me a bit of Rudy Ray Moore. Rudy Ray Moore? Dolomite. What are, is that an English word? How do you know my language? You've never seen Dolomite? Dolomite. I thought it was Vegemite. The Human Tornado, Dolomite's second movie? You never saw these movies? You've got to be kidding me. I don't me. know what you're... I, don't, I have no idea what you're blathering on about right now. You don't know Rudy Ray Moore? No. no. I've never met him. Whatever he did is no responsibility of mine whatsoever. Dolomite. You don't know Dolomite? Dolom, is this is it is it a a miracle food a fabric of a fucking a product from Uranus Corporation? What is it? I'm I'm stunned right now that I figured. Is it soil and green? No, it's a movie. It's a character that Rudy Ray Moore played, Dolomite. It's um I guess black exploitation would be the way that I would put it. And he has an all girl kung fu army, <laughs> and he talks in rhymes, and he does his own karate, which is the worst karate in the history of motion pictures. But these movies are amazing. And I'm shocked with Yafet Kodo. He's in one of those movies. Yafet Kodo is in the picture? Yes. Do you know Yafet Kodo? The, the, the bald pimp from all the great 70s movies. Right. He's in Dolomite. Now, how old is he now? Hold on. Let me see if I have... What, are you going to look up and see how old Yafet Kodo is now? No, I'm going to see... I'm going to play you a second or two of this. I don't know if this will You're make YouTube. You're trying to get me in a good mood. I am. Right. I don't know if this is going to make YouTube, but we're going to try this anyway and see if you hear a little bit of this trailer and this brings back any memories of maybe you saw this it at some Rudy point. This is Ray Moore, better known as Dolomite. Now I'd like to show you just a few scenes from my latest adventure. Damn, look like my women is on time. Babe, I could show warm you up. No shit, baby. I can hear you. Dolomite is my name, and spin up motherfuckers is my game. <laughs> Breathing down your neck. He just shot a bunch of people. I'm trying to find his one part where he just starts rhyming yeah. random <laughs> words together, and it's. When, when does Red Fox pop in for a cameo? <laughs> Tell Biden not to burst Sergio son. I'm the one that had the elephants roosting in trees and all the ants wearing BBD. From the first to the last, I give them the blast so fast that their life is passed before their ass has even hit the grass. See me uptown, downtown, crowned and renowned. Delayed, relayed, mislaid, and parlayed. Hatch, match, snatch, and scratch. Quack, jack, smack. Boot black, black jack, race back, and black jack, and still coming back. If you crave satisfaction, this is the place to find that action. Coming to this theater as this next attraction is the picture that will put you in traction. Dolomite, starring me, Rudy Ray Moore, as Dolomite, and that bad Durville Martin as Willie Green. Dolomite. Dolomite. All right, maybe I'm wrong. I, f I thought Yafikoto was in there, but uh, he clearly wasn't. Yeah, maybe you're wrong. Well, I'm, you're trying to put me in a good mood, and this really, really, because you have no idea what I'm going to talk about, and I had no idea you were going to play that because this just came up, but I don't know how we transition from that clip to police brutality and shooting of unarmed black men in the streets. Yeah, I don't know about that transition. Maybe this won't be on YouTube. <laughs> I think... Because the part this... we're going to talk about here in a second ain't going to be on YouTube. Are we back on now? Or are, we, are we back on YouTube? Well, hold on. Let's make it official. Okay. For the people on YouTube, 
You just missed a lot of good programming. YouTube shouldn't be so fucking uh, weaselly. Anyway, uh, let's get into this program. I'll try to get in a better mood after I've vented about all this shit. An update. JimCornette.com, Cornette's Collectibles customers. It can happen to you. Just got an email. Want to read this from Craig in the UK. Hi, Jim. My order arrived to me in the UK within eight days of you posting it. We've been talking about eight weeks, eight days. The merch is first class, and the fact that the order packing and postage is taken care of you, taken care of by you personally, makes the purchase experience even better. Worth every penny and so much more. Well, there you have it. It can happen to you, folks. Eight days to the United Kingdom. Uh, it can also be eight weeks and anywhere in between. And we have no fucking rhyme or reason to this, folks. So international orders. Keep waiting. Everything's been sent out. As a matter of fact, all the orders through Saturday morning, August 22nd, were sent out on Monday, August 24th, even the internationals, and all the orders through Wednesday morning, August 26th, are packed up as we tape this and ready to go out Friday morning, August 28th. I have battled back, feeling good, moving good. I did some push-ups, some chin-ups. I threw up once. I'm okay now. <laughs> and for the folks who want to purchase things from Cornette's Collectibles at jimcornette.com. Jump in right now because the last I'll update, the last two weeks of September, we're going to be closing the store again for my birthday and also to restock on, a, on everything that we can possibly restock for the Christmas season. So uh, the last two weeks of September store will be closed. Get your orders in while I have time right now and they'll be flying, winging their way to you uh, as quickly as possible. And also we should mention for our uh, patrons on Patreon, uh, new shows have gone up, right? We, a bunch of new shows. We are at all kinds of shows now. How many, how many, can you quantify the number of shows that we are at on the Patreon channel now? Oh, geez. I think it's, uh, Oh, geez. Well, there's, there's a firm number. I think it's somewhat over, it's somewhere over 120 shows are currently available drive through in the experience. Well, the point is, for five bucks a month, what we have done here, we're just giving this stuff away, is we've started at the beginning, and the experiences and drive throughs from number one straight on in order are going up on the Patreon site, So if, and, and we're up to 2015 now, so the first year and a half or whatever, but hundreds of hours of all kinds of stuff you might want to hear for five bucks, right? How could, where, where do they go to get this incredible deal? Patreon.com slash Cornet. Only $5 a month gets you in the door. Access to the archives. New episodes added each and every Sunday evening. We are right now in the spring of 2015. Shows start at the end of 2013. So there's a lot of stuff there. And we just put up some episodes. I think another Dr. Tom Pritchard episode. Recent episodes have had J.J. Dillon. Great stuff. Check it out today. Classic episodes of the drive through and the experience. Hear how we got to this point. Patreon.com slash Cornette. When does it get really good? Long about the early part of 2016, uh, a new voice appears. Somewhere around, I think, February, January or February 2016, yeah. And uh, well, once we get to those shows, then immediately the Patreon subscribership is going to go through the roof. Yeah, we'll see. I think people like the classic stuff, even though... Because of, well, because of the change in voice. We had my my previous co-host had such a masculine voice that they loved it when you came along because you you had a, such a better contrast. You have such a higher voice than my previous co-host. It was more of a contrast. I want to say something. I was reviewing some classic content. I was playing a clip actually for Suzanne because I thought she would get a kick out of it. And I think I've bumped into Alice's best moment ever on the show. <laughs> it was you telling the Terry Landell story early on, and she didn't know anything about it because she didn't know wrestling. So she reads a question, you know, what's the story with you trying to kill Terry Landell? And you immediately go from zero, you're like, oh, yeah, I tried to kill him. I could say it now yeah, because yeah. I'm double jeopardy. Well, well, yeah, double jeopardy. They can't try me again. Yeah. And you start telling the story and you're like 10 minutes into this story and it's insane. I mean, the whole thing's insane. And you just stop and you go, am I going on too long? And she quietly just goes, no, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> and then you keep going. Best moment she ever had on the show. I, I popped. I laughed my ass off at that. 
Uh, well, there were some of those inad inadvertent snickers in those days, folks. But that's the uh, that's the Patreon. Uh, and oh, oh, we we have a note, a bulletin. Breaking news has crossed the news desk here. Congratulations to Aiden Heckel. Ah. Hey. Aiden's team won the Kentucky Special Olympics 1A state softball state softball title. God, that's hard to say. The let's try it again. His team won the Kentucky Special Olympics 1A state <laughs> softball title, and it's a back-to-back -back deal. They won it last year too, and he also played and won on the the, the state on the 2A team. So he's a, he's this he's softball Sid reincarnated as Aiden Heckel. Congratulations, Aiden, and Travis is a, a wonderful softball dad also. Unlike Sid, Aiden does it all natural. Well, no, there you no go. No performance-enhancing drugs with Aiden Heckle. I can testify to that. He, he's a very clean-living young man. Aiden Heckle could pass any of the tests that uh, WCW or WWF could administer and would not need Harvey Whippleman's urine to do it. He could out hit Sid and he would chase him away with a squeegee too. He can do it all. <laughs> he can do it all, baby. Um, I got another email from, I just, uh, it, it's a long one. I'm just going to excerpt a few things, but it, it, it goes into what we've been talking about here recently on the program and the AEW reviews and, and their fans and their fans mindset. Um, Hey, Jim and Brian, he included you in this too. Uh, but hey, Jim and Brian, uh, blah, 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 blah. I have on a few occasions posted comments on AEW videos criticizing politely the booking and the production in general, and each time I'm chased out like a pedophile at prep school for simply sharing my opinion. I don't understand what these people are drinking or what bizarre hypnosis the balding bucks have been able to cast onto these poor souls. I have routinely been told my negative comments aren't helpful and I should fuck off back to 1999. Now, it's gotten to the point where 1999 is now considered a long time ago. Holy fuck. Dave Meltzer told me he wishes he could join me in 1985. You weren't born in 1985. I was born, but if I was going to go back, I'd go back to 86. The Mets won the World Series. Well, there you, you've mentioned that. Um, he says I should fuck off back to 1999 because spreading positivity is what AEW needs. This is a huge problem for this company who, in the midst of a cancel culture world where inclusion is paramount above talent, have secured a fan base that keeps saying they want more of this nonsense. YouTube analytics is important these days. And I know for a fact that Tony Khan and his team read the 50 or so blindly positive comments on each video and convince themselves that they are doing the right thing, much like that South Park episode where they are loving the smell of their own smug. Um... Wrestling is blowing my mind at the moment because the representation online is that everything is overly positive and awesome. And this is this is the line that got me. It's the only event entertainment product where the acidic online presence is people being positive, not negative. Think about this. Everything the world <laughs> sucks because pretty much the world sucks, but everybody always complains about how everything sucks. With it, the problem is the exact opposite. Nothing with these people about this program sucks when it so obviously sucks. Anyway, uh, Jamie continues. Our favorite sports teams are lambasted online and people are unnecessarily cruel because they didn't win a game. But with AEW, it's a massive online love fest. How is this happening? I guess people have just given up and don't have the energy to fight it. I'm now starting to think, that Tony Khan cannot seriously be this blind and it must be this way by design. They must be happy with 500,000 to a million fragile snowflake viewers and must think that putting out a compelling boundary pushing product will eventually offend someone and they end up getting canceled. So instead it's all inclusive wrestling by the young bucks and friends come and play. We don't bite. May I add that I have no problem with inclusivity but to repeat my point, they are doing this at the sacrifice of talent and skill. Inclusivity should be in addition to and not instead of. I thought that was kind of interesting. And he's from London. The most perceptive people are from across the pond. But, you know, it, it's, 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 yeah, everybody else is overwhelmingly negative. It's the only place in the world, this is the only situation where they can't do anything wrong in these people's, well, I know. 
We just talked about a previous instance where you can't do anything wrong. We have found the opposite of the Trump supporter. I, I've, I've admitted Democrats have lunatics too. The opposite of the Trump supporter, they're not dangerous, they're just annoying, is the AEW fan. They will believe anything they're told and and feed or and, and gobble up the fucking pablum that they're fed just like the Trumpers do. They said they're not dangerous. They're just stupid. Well, think about how the Young Bucks have marketed themselves. It's kind of like a wrestling culture war. You know, out with the old, in with us. You know, if you, you, know, if you, if you like anything that's old or anyone old gives you advice that you don't want, screw them. Let's get them away from wrestling. If anybody tells you the truth about how you suck and you shouldn't be doing this, well, fuck them. Don't listen to them. <clears throat> anyway, you know what? Here's here's what I think. I think I still believe that if these modern gymnastic play wrestlers actually sat down, Brian, and ate a good hearty meal, <laughs> they would grow. They would grow and they would look healthy and intimidating. And I know where you can get a, a, a healthy, hearty meal full of calories and and goodness and taste and quality food none other than our friends at omaha steaks folks they will make you grow up and be big time professional wrestlers instead of cosplay midgets and right now omaha steaks is offering a steakhouse grilling package with a limited time offer just for my listeners we've talked about the great steaks and the chicken the pork chops the kielbasa those bacon-wrapped filet mignons are incredible. The burgers. Now, you can go to omahasteaks.com, enter the code JCE into the search bar. When you get one of these steakhouse grilling packages, four free burgers, four of the gourmet jumbo franks. And these, these jumbo franks, they're as big as fucking kielbasas. They're huge. They're, they're, they're plump even. The girth of them is ridiculous. So anyway... The Grand Summer Grill-Out Package. Eat like you're at the best steakhouse in town while you're in the house safe and sound. Smoky sweet bacon, fork tender filet mignon, all this food for much less than going out to a restaurant. Go to omahasteaks.com, type JCE in the search bar, get the four jumbo franks, the four steak burgers free to complete your order. Everything flash frozen, vacuum sealed, safely delivered in a cooler with dry ice. That means it, it's it's just like it just came. It just got cut off the cow. It's just that fresh. OmahaSteaks.com. Have is your is your mouth watering yet, Brian? Absolutely. Enter the promo code Austin Aries and get your hey. free Omaha steaks. <laughs> no, hey, no, <laughs> what in the world? No, that's it. Only if you want turnips. That's right. And you have uh, the promo code Aries. He he ate a turnip in frustration. Yes. Let, let, no wonder Austin Aries is only five foot three. He never ate a goddamn decent meal when he was a growing boy, and he's still a growing boy. Omaha steaks can make you grow up full adult size, folks. Be like the great Brian last. We've said it before. Eat filet mignon at least once a week with Omaha steaks. Well, be like an Omaha steaks customer and eat filet mignon at least once a week. They don't have to be like you. Hey, come on. I'm great. Heavens. I'm great. You're, you're great. Man. <laughs> <laughs> but Omaha steaks are awesome. What was that? Fucking, what was that? <laughs> God damn that outlaw guy. Uh, war, whorehouse. Warhorse. <laughs> that, that worked with Cody on AEW a few weeks. His, his, his catchphrase was warhorse rules ass. So here he is, ladies and gentlemen. No, the it was it? Was that really? Yes, it was. <laughs> that is his guy. Go right now. You can do it faster than I can. Go to some of his social media. His catchphrase was "War Horse Rules Ass." Like yes, ladies and gentlemen. Introducing now, the the ruler of the kingdom of asses. What the fuck? Oh my god! I'm on his Twitter right now. War Horse Rules Ass. <laughs> <laughs> what a goof. I'm not making this stuff up. All right. Well, Jim, you know, I know you burned a bunch of people at the beginning of the show, and I'm sure we're going to do it at the end with the smack, with the SmackDown, with the SummerSlam review. 
Let's get something good in the middle, a good sandwich, something yes. classic wrestling related. Yes. I actually have an email that was sent to me by Mike Sempervivi. You probably best know him as the host of the Mid-Atlantic Championship Podcast on the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network. You might know him best that way, but I know him as a longtime wrestling correspondent, a journalist even. Midatlanticpod.com are available wherever you find your favorite podcast. But here's his email. I thought this was interesting. So let me get your uh, opinion or take or views or whatever you want to add to this. All right. Which hopefully will be better than what I'm doing before yeah, right here. It couldn't possibly be any worse. So go ahead. This was sent on the 20th. So as we're recording, it was sent to me a week ago. Just let me clarify the time. This past week marks the 35th anniversary of the Midnight Express's debut in the traditional end of Jim Crockett Promotions, appearing on the TV tapings in Greenville and Shelby, August 12th and 13th. After coming from Dallas, where you worked many small towns, which were often on their ass, and almost always against the Fantastics, did you get a feeling of deja vu coming to Georgia and working small towns such as Blackshear or Jasper, (laughs) which were often on their ass, (laughs) and almost exclusively with the Sawyers, who couldn't have been as easy to work with as Tommy and Bobby, the Fantastics. Oh, um, I, I know, I know. Well, I know he has other questions because <clears throat> you prepped me on the on the email on this one, but I want to address it because we'll get confusing and and it'll people will lose track of the first question. Um, we had just come from Dallas, and the reason why we went to Atlanta instead of going to Charlotte was because when. Vince had taken over the TBS time slot in 1984. There had been such a backlash from the fans. We, you know, where's Gordon Soley? We want our fucking NWA wrestling. What the fuck is this? It was it was a complete style mismatch, and, and people didn't get it. WWF wrestling suddenly on TBS. So Turner hedged a little bit by giving Ole Anderson, who had been, obviously, Ole was at that time the owner of Georgia Championship, the majority owner of, uh, or he had been, until fucking Vince took it out from under him. He'd been running the Georgia office. So Ole got an early morning time slot, I think 7.30, wasn't it, on Saturday mornings for an hour of championship wrestling from Georgia. And... He had brought in a lot of talent. Lawler came down and worked a lot of talent from Memphis because that was the territory right up on top of him and, and other, you know, NWA territories, Southern territories, sent some guys. And finally, after what, close to a year or so, not even maybe, um, Crockett made the deal with Vince. Vince needed to finance the first WrestleMania. Crockett gave him a million dollars for the TBS time slot. And Vince... Brokered by book, Jim Barnett. Brokered by Jim Barnett. And Vince took that money and financed the first WrestleMania, and Crockett had the national TV. Which, And then there's a side story in that that Turner had promised Bill Watts because Mid-South Wrestling, but then also he put on TBS on Sunday afternoons, it was getting better ratings than everything. And he was going to go into business with Watts, but when Crockett came calling, he reneged on the deal with Watts, or we could have seen Watts fighting Vince, which would have been... Actually, probably hella interesting. But anyway, when you say better ratings than everything, not just everything in wrestling, it was the highest rated show on cable television. Yeah. Mid-South Wrestling for what, three or four months there that run on Sunday afternoons was the highest rated show on cable television. Anyway, when Crockett took over TBS, Ole still had a show and still had an office. They had an office in Atlanta. They had towns booked, building contracts. So I don't know all the financial and paperwork, uh, you know, arrangements, but Ole was welcomed because Ole had been Booker and top star for Jim Crockett for the previous, you know, fucking 20 years. So Ole was welcomed back into the fold and they were going to try to run the Atlanta office with all, with the TV contracts they had, um, in, in Georgia and, and, you know, the, the, the buildings they had booked, they also, Georgia had been the first ones to do the Northern tours off of TBS. So Georgia back in 81, it started going to Ohio, West Virginia and Michigan, the Sheik's territory that he had let, let languish after he'd gone out of business. 
And the Georgia office had been doing better business there for a few years than they were in Georgia. And then that went downhill too when the TV was taken off and the, the television was screwed up and blah, blah, blah. So the point is, you had the Charlotte end of the territory that was the traditional uh, uh, schedule, and then you had a crew of guys in Georgia fulfilling those dates and the arenas that had been booked and et cetera, and Georgia was on its ass. And that's where they moved us to because... Dusty didn't want to bring us right into Charlotte because he had established the Rock and Roll Express in July. They came in and beat the Russians for the world tag title their first night on television. And he wanted to keep the Rock and Roll and the Midnight apart for six months so that he could build the Midnight separately. So he thought, well, it'd be a good idea. We'll put them in Georgia. We'll let them get over down there. They'll be on TBS, and then we'll start bringing them to the syndicated televisions that we do in the Carolinas. And by the end of the year, we'll fold both territories together, and they'll be up here, and then we pull the trigger on the express angle. <clears throat> well, the only optimistic part of that was they thought that the Atlanta end could limp along for six more months, and it couldn't. Um Mike's question, coming from Dallas, where we worked many small towns, which were often on their ass, that's actually not particularly accurate. The towns in Dallas, even then in 85, after the boom period had started to settle down, that were on their ass were all the towns in South Texas. The old uh, San Antonio Territory towns that they were trying to run, Corpus Christi, Laredo, um, my God, Harlingen right down there on the border and these spot shows we've talked about um, that one time we were at a spot show in South Texas, like 30 miles from the Mexican border in a tin shed in a mud field with a sign on the front of it on a sheet and spray painted wrestling tonight. Right. <clears throat> Those towns were shitty. Um, and West Texas was not doing real good because that had been traditionally the, the, the funk territory and, and, you know, they had taken it over and it did okay with the Von Erichs and the Freebirds. But when that cooled off, they didn't keep track of West Texas. Like, the Guerrero still promoted El Paso, and that was a real good town. But Amarillo and Lubbock, Nick Roberts was at that time not exactly a fireball promoter. And oftentimes you would see him sleeping in the ring trailer. So, but the small towns around the Dallas area were fucking incredible. You know, you'd go to, to a, I remember one time Grand Prairie, Texas, was in the Metroplex, literally 10 miles from our apartment. We did $16,000. That was 2,000 people at those ticket prices. Um, anything in the Dallas Metroplex was cooking, and anything out of it wasn't. So, unfortunately, when we moved to Georgia, nothing was cooking. The Omni got everybody. They got all the Crockett guys and everything, but the Georgia towns just got me <laughs> you know the midnight express buzz and brett sawyer were a top heel team pez watley um uh, the italian stallion all the guys that they were given ray candy i think was still i was the last time i was in georgia ray candy was still there anyway it was that those towns were rotten and it was our job to work with Buzz and Brett Sawyer every night in these in these shows because they were to put us over and establish us as a top heel team. And Brett Sawyer was fine. He, you know, he was an okay worker and an okay guy, and you know, nothing wrong with him. Buzz was a tremendous worker when he wanted to be, and a complete mental case, and a fucking drug addict, and a prick. And he knew that they were finishing him up because it, Dusty was finishing him up and going to move him out. And as a matter of fact, Dick Slater was there also. Slater was the booker in Atlanta, and he knew that he was about to be moved out. He'd already been superseded by Dusty being the booker of everything, and now he knew they were about to move him out, and he was fixed to go to Mid-South, so he wasn't real fucking pleased either. And he took Buzz with him. And he took Buzz with him, and, thank, and, not, and actually Buzz no-showed, ended up, I think they left a couple weeks early. Because they didn't want to, he, Buzz didn't, Brett didn't care. Buzz didn't want to do the fucking jobs. And Buzz was still thinking it was three years before when he was the top heel in Georgia, and it wasn't. And there was this one night, and was, I've told this story before, but it's been a while, and it's Rodeo Arena in somewhere in suburban Atlanta. 
I can't remember goddamn what the town was, but it was literally where they had rodeos and a building where they had rodeos and cattle shows. And at the time, um, Dusty had had a meeting with all the talent. As a matter of fact, that, that goes into the second part of the email, which I have now pulled up in front of me. So I'll, I'll help you with, uh, after that first question, uh, Mike continued, you knew how exciting the North end was getting. Actually, it was the East end, Charlotte's East of Atlanta. But did you ever do any second guessing, especially in the two weeks before Dusty met with you at TBS studios on July 13th to basically give you a vote of confidence and to reiterate that the team always goes over no matter of the match or situation. Actually, Dusty didn't meet with us to do that specifically. He called one of his meetings at TBS for the entire roster and he would let them know things that were going on that they needed to know. And one of them, he said, I want to welcome the Midnight Express and Jim Cornette. They're coming in. They're going to be a top heel team. I want to let everybody know from this point on, they're going over. No matter where it is, they're going over. They're going over till I stay different. They're going to win everything. Because <laughs> he wanted all the boys to know, right? Well, it wasn't long after this meeting. We're at this rodeo building. And fucking Buzz is selling so he can give Brett the tag because Buzz didn't want to do the job, so Brett do the job. Buzz had to sell. So Bobby Eaton brings Buzz over to the ropes, and he's choking him over the rope, and Bobby gives me the Iggy, and he takes the referee. So I come over, and I give Buzz a shot to the neck with the racket. Boom. Well, and they work for him another minute, and then they come over, and then Bobby's got Buzz on the ropes again. And it's the same fucking thing. And as he backs up, I'm going to go take another little poke to get some heat. And Buzz out of nowhere. Oh, and also Dusty in the meeting said, and nobody touches Jim Cornette until I say so. Because he didn't want anybody taking the heat off of me. I think he was probably talking to Buzz Sawyer at this time. As I go up to give Buzz another poke, Buzz comes from I don't know where the fuck with his right hand and slaps me, but he didn't slap me in the cheek. He slapped me in the flat of the face right on my nose because I didn't know it was coming, so I didn't feed him for it. He just took the whack. Fuck, nose starts bleeding. I'm like, motherfucker. And I fucking got hot, and Bobby gets back on top of him. He's choking him. He's like, you're not supposed to touch corny. I'm like, fuck it, I don't care. I took that racket and bent it sideways and whacked that fucking dog-faced motherfucker about four times right across the goddamn fucking forehead with it, sideways with the frame. And he got hot, and now he's trying to crawl out from under Bobby Eaton to come out there, well, you're hitting me like a mark. I said, you just hit me like you're a mark. So anyway. Um, they finished the fucking match and we go back in the heel trailer. We're dressing in trailers. I mean, like uh, uh, not to Winnebago trailers, not like giant trailer trailers. And we go back in now. What the fuck's with his fucking, you know, what's his problem? Right. And fucking Bobby and Dennison with the referee. I think Mike fever. I think it was, we're the only ones in there. All of a sudden we hear this Rrr! and there was a wooden box that they put next to this Winnebago that you stepped up on and then opened the door and come in. You've, you've been in a Winnebago, right? Here comes Buzz Sawyer. He clomps up on that box and he fucking opens the door and pulls the door off the Winnebago, the screen door, not the big one. And he's, what are you fucking hitting me like a mark for? I said, what are you fucking hitting me like a mark for? Right now it's Buzz Sawyer and there's four of us. But he's crazy, so Dennis has got his hand in his bag just in case, because if Buzz Sawyer decides to make a further issue out of this, he's going to get shot between the eyes. We normally reserve that fucking uh, for the fans that were chasing us down the highway, but this is a different situation. So anyway, he screams and yells and slobbers a little bit and fucking leaves, and when he goes out, he's already torn, he tore the goddamn screen door off the hinge right so it's hanging and as he goes out he grabs the door to steady himself walking down and the door completely comes off so he misses the step and falls over the goddamn box and fucking and then he throws the box and he walks off and i think that was the night that he the next day he just said fucking he left two weeks early didn't um, you ever run in with slater as the booker too well yes that was the week before in ohio I think that's another thing that that uh, called this meeting because we had gotten on the Ohio tour and 
Dusty had already told us we were supposed to go over, blah, 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 right? We got on the Ohio tour, and I can't remember. I'd have to get my book out, but it was like, you know, we're in Columbus and then, you know, uh, 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 not Accra, Canton, Canton Civic Center, and uh, like Wheeling, West Virginia, that type of mid-level market tours that they were doing up there. And we worked with Slater and Buzz one night and go 30 minutes Broadway in the main event. And it wasn't that fucking great. And so the next day, you know, Bobby and Dennis said, well, maybe you better find out, Corny. So the next day I called the office in Charlotte, not to stooge, but just to relay the information. We're supposed to be going over and we didn't go over. We went Broadway. I see. I'll take care of it. That was Jimmy Crockett because Dusty was on the road. So that night we go in the locker room. I've got the fucking hot dogs from the goddamn concession stand because we haven't eaten fucking dinner. And I'm fucking sitting down with my drink and my hot dogs. And Slater comes in and says, I need to see you, Cornette. No, oh, fuck. Can I finish my hot dogs? I don't think you're going to want to. Okay. I go in the room and, uh, you know, closed up with Slater. I figure, okay, he knocked out John Matuzik. So he can't really fucking fight me or else it'll make him look bad. So uh, you made a phone call to the office. I said, Dick. We were told we were brought in here. We were supposed to go over every night, regardless of who or what, and we didn't. So we wanted to know if we'd been given wrong information or by who. And he said, well, they got a date book next month, but I, you know, they, they don't tell me what they're, they're going to come back with, and I don't know how to figure these finish. It was like if he was going to figure a different finish, but he didn't know what they were coming back with. They're coming back without you is what they were coming back with, and he knew that, right? <laughs> So I said, well, I said, no, no, you know, not trying to stir anything up. Just want to make sure we're doing the right thing. He said, well, come to me if you have any questions, which I never had any questions for the next week. He was still there. But anyway, that was, the, no, we didn't second guess anything because he told us from the start, we're going to put you here for six months and then get you over on the TV and then feed you in with the rock and roll. And actually, I liked that period of time. We were there in Atlanta for three months. And I liked it because we were home a lot. We had to go on those shitty tours to Ohio and West Virginia. But you go to fucking Columbus on Saturday night and you're it's, it's 90 miles. You're back by 1130. By midnight, I had a pizza, a big fucking gallon soft drink and Joe Petticino superstars of wrestling tape to watch for the next six hours. Almost every Sunday was off except for Marietta. And, uh, you know, Macon was... 70 miles augusta was 150 miles so we were there for three months and then they just closed the whole thing down and brought us to atlanta or brought us to to charlotte so it, it was a nice little you know intermission there but we weren't we're and then it, we, like like is in this email they had already brought us up by august for the syndicated tv i think we made our first date at the charlotte coliseum in september or october off the top of my head and once we got there, Dennis had obviously, you know, early in his career, he had refereed in the Carolinas and he knew what a fucking huge territory, what a big money territory it was. He'd always wanted to go there as a top guy. So all the way up there, he's going, well, you see this place. We walked into Charlotte Coliseum, that 12,000 seats, that round fucking building. And then we see, because we'd been told the territory was on its ass. And the house that night in Charlotte was $60,000. That was a little over 6,000 people. And I looked out and I, 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 I can't even, it may have been Tully. I was standing there and I said, I thought the territory was on its ass. He said, it is. Cause that was half a house within six months. We were selling the fucking thing out. So I, you know, and I heard how those people reacted and we had an underneath match with a couple of underneath guys and got a good win, but I heard the way the people reacted. I, just, I saw the way they reacted to the matches all night. I said, okay, if this is the real Charlotte territory, we've made the right decision. They're into it, they're ready to go, and they need something different they want to fucking see. And that's what we did, and, and then it was beautiful. But anyway, continue on with Mike's uh, or any follow-up of your own. Well, I was going to say, how long after Crockett made the deal with Ole did they push out Thunderbolt Patterson? Because almost remember, immediately, yeah, <laughs> Ole had been using Thunderbolt, and him and Thunderbolt were like a baby faced tag team. Yeah, and then as soon as the Crockett deal went down, Ole and I think Gene 
who was well past his, you know, when he should yeah. be on TV at that point, turn on Thunderbolt, and then Thunderbolt is just gone. Yeah, well, it, Thunderbolt kept, only booked Thunderbolt, only liked Thunderbolt at some level. He also realized that of all the money that Thunderbolt had drawn in the entire business in his career, probably 70% of it was in the state of Georgia. That's the one place that you could still get something out of Thunderbolt Patterson at that time because his his work always sucked. I saw him in the 70s, and it was a shits. But his promos and just his personality, especially with the black audience, got over like a million dollars. So you worked around it, right? But by that point, the work was worse, and he wasn't drawing either. And the promos were had, had you know, he only booked him because he liked him and because of his history, but also the way Thunderbolt Patterson got booked in Georgia for the last 10 years of his career was he would come to whoever was running it and threaten to go to the newspapers, talk about racial discrimination, expose the business, uh, the whole of, uh, uh, what was the football player's name? The goddamn goofy football player. Help me. I've gone blank. Jim Wilson, Jim Wilson. Jim Wilson. He and Jim Wilson were always together. They'll go to, and Thunderbolt had buddied up and knew all of the civic leaders and the, the uh, civil rights people in town. We'll cause trouble if you don't fucking book us. Th that's flat out the offer that was made. And so the, he kept getting jobs at intermittent times in Georgia, and that was the last one. But Crockett wasn't going to put up with it, and he didn't want him to begin with. So that's where Thunderbolt went. Hey, real quick, because I've mentioned this to you, but I don't know if you've ever actually heard it. I'm going to play you a quick promo. It's not long. This is from 1990. Ole Anderson takes over as the booker, and his first moves are to bring back Junkyard Dog, gets Paul Orndorff in, which I guess was to replace Kerry Von Erich, who decided not to come in, Mr. Wrestling 2 back on TV to be a special referee, and Thunderbolt, for the first time in five years, is on yep. TBS Wrestling. This is a promo he did. This is Thunderbolt Patterson. Amazing intensity. You look at him, you're like, wow, this guy's saying something, but he says nothing. He says nothing. Listen to this and tell me what you think. This is from 1990. Okay. Wrestling gave me the opportunity again to keep my eyeballs on the old lady. You have ruined folks' lives. Not talking about how you dealt with mine in the past, but in the recently. You have been getting on everybody's case. So this Sunday... If you move, if you move, if you move, I am going, if you move, this Sunday, it's time to, ooh, I'm so full, I'm full up there here. Same old, but they say it's going to be a change. There will be a change. History has already been made. Call somebody. Tell somebody. Only if you move. Just move. Ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> so again, he says nothing. But yeah, and, and part, you had to look at him and look at his eyes. And you had to see him saying it. And when he was jacked up, when he was fucking built in the in the 70s, when he, you know. It was it was something, and and he he didn't talk like a wrestler. He talked like a a preacher in a black church, and it was and that's why when he went with um with Ann Gunkel, that's one of the th Thunderbolts. One of the things that kept her around as long as she was around, because that was a big deal in Georgia to have Thunderbolt Patterson in the early seventies. But there, there was one famous story they, they used to tell long after he'd left the territory, back in the, the 70s TBS days. They, would, they were doing the TBS show, and you know how, remember at the end of the TBS show on Saturday nights, the last two minutes would be an interview segment where they would kind of fill up whatever time they had left, and they'd have the, like the group of baby faces out there or the group of heels yeah. or whatever, and they'd plug the... And they were running Carrollton that night. Carrollton, Georgia was a spot show on Saturday nights. And Ole told Thunderbolt, said, just go out. And every time we mention Carrollton, it does better. If we don't mention it, nobody comes. But if we just mention we're going to be in Carrollton, you know, then, then it, the house is up. And a lot of times, 
you would just hear one of the guys come out and say at the end of the show, and tonight we're being Carrollton, 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 right? The hogs are coming to Carrollton. So they tell Thunderbolt, go out and plug, just plug Carrollton, just plug Carrollton. And he's got like 45 seconds. And Soli gives the mic to him and it puts the mic in front of him. And Thunderbolt, he does that thing where he, he wipes his face with his hand and comes over his face and he gets the expression. And then he clenches his fist in front of himself and he takes that deep breath. And then he lets it out. <laughs> and then the look of anguish comes on his face. And he says, oh, if I only had time. And they go <laughs> off the air. <laughs> All he had to say was, tonight I'm going to be in Carrollton. But no, he did his shit for 30 seconds and then said, if I only had time. In that, if you move promo, he says one of his, I guess the lines that people remember from Thunderbolt is, I'm full. I'm full up to here. Yeah. Didn't only one say that. Can't what are you take f- no more? Yeah, what are you full of? <laughs> it, well, see, that's the thing is at that point, Thunderbolt was still talking to all the people he'd been talking to for 20 years, and they knew. But for the people now on TBS that seeing him in fucking Montana, they're like, what the fuck is this guy talking about? Because they didn't know. It all made sense to people who had seen Thunderbolt. He a full up to here. And gonna be a change come because I'm full. Can't you tell him I'm full? I've had it. It's funny. We talk about 1990 and Thunderbolt. And I'll get back to Mike's question after this. But on the most recent episode of John Arezzi's Pro Wrestling Spotlight, Steve Beverly's on the show. Uh, Pro Wrestling Spotlight then and now, I should say, where we review the original broadcast of Pro Wrestling Spotlight. And they're talking about Thunderbolt being back on TBS all of a sudden. And Steve Beverly just laughs. He goes, you know, I kind of think it's amazing. You would see Thunderbolt at all these things like the Democratic conventions handing out flyers that Ted Turner's a racist because yeah. <laughs> he won't use them. And now all of a sudden he's back on TBS <laughs> as soon as they bring him back. But here's uh, from Mike's uh, email here. You worked with the only other babyface tag team in the state of Georgia at the time, Pistol Pez Watley and the Italian Stallion. <laughs> what were those matches typically like? Pez was a legit college wrestler who had a high motor and several years of experience at the time. But what about Gary Cortinelli, who they seemed to have some hope for at the time? Obviously, he didn't pan out at a higher level, but did you see any glimmers of said hope? Were you expected to go 20 minutes every night, or could you pretty much do what you wanted? And I have to say, as soon as you mention Italian Stallion, I think about that may have been the December clash in 88. It was like almost 20 minutes, him and Dr. Death. (laughs) And it was just dreadful, just awful. Well, see, that's the thing. We did go 20 minutes every night because, and we wanted to. Uh, it wasn't like they expected us and were making us, especially when we were the main events on some of those small town cards. Um, you know, we want to give the people their their money's worth. And it wasn't hard at all. We're not talking television. We're talking house shows where the heels are calling the thing. Uh, Pez did have a, we knew Pez from Tennessee. Pez was Um, heck of an amateur at the University of Chattanooga. Nick Goulas had broke him in. He knew Bobby and Dennis from ages. Um, And, you know, I had had seen him and and then after I got into business, had worked with him a couple of times. But, you know, Pez was good. And this was before the Shaska Watley thing. He was a heck of a baby face. And Pez could sell. And the stallion at the time, Gary Cortinelli is his Italian stallion real name. Um, Stallion was like 250, strong as a bull. He had been an amateur on a regional level. Um, We used to joke he had the world's largest head. You couldn't get a headlock on the Italian Stallion. You couldn't reach around his goddamn giant fucking bulbous head. But he could do shit. You can can watch the old TBS Saturday night shows and see that he, today, you would probably, Italian Stallion would get used in a main event spot. If he was around today, um, he j- he couldn't cut a promo and it just, he was still green at that point in time, but it was no problem for Bobby Eaton, Dennis Condry to have a 20 minute spot show match with those guys and people be fucking screaming. And it w- it was easy. They weren't stiff or hard or whatever, or didn't have bad attitudes. So that was not a problem at all. It was actually easier having those matches than it was working with the fucking Sawyers and the people saw the Sawyers as main event guys at the time. 
But Stallion, Stallion's primary uh, uh, spot in Crockett Promotions from like 85 to 87 was as handsome Jimmy Valiant's chauffeur. Because Jimmy wasn't going to drive anywhere. Jimmy, when we would run Rock Hill, South Carolina, 13 miles from my apartment, you would we would pass by the convenience store and see Jimmy Valiant's car five miles from his apartment sitting in the parking lot because he would have met Stallion and Stallion would have driven him the other eight miles. Um, Why but, is you that? Know, <laughs> because Jimmy wasn't going to fucking drive. I, he had that disease where every time his feet hit the fucking carpet of the car, he went to sleep. So it it was a rib that he would actually, he'd get a ride from one side of his apartment complex to the other almost. And then also Jimmy and Stal, they knew when they went to the spot shows in the Carolinas down the state roads, they knew the, the places in those little towns to stop by trial and error where the people that ran the markets and the groceries and, and things were big fans and they'd stop and come out with bag full of free groceries on the way to the goddamn shows. We'd take the interstate and just buy them ourselves. Hey, uh, one, but fi- anyway. one final part of this email here. On August 17th to August 23rd, a Northern Georgia tour was scheduled, including two dates planned for Indianapolis and Fort Wayne, Indiana. Okay, that, that's written uh, in an old, unwieldy fashion. Georgia had Northern tours, they called them, which were in Ohio and West Virginia and Michigan, etc. So it wasn't a tour of North Georgia. It was a Georgia Northern tour. Go ahead. After two shows in Columbus and Cleveland, the tour was abruptly canceled. You noted in your book the cancellation gave the team an unplanned yet much needed vacation. Do you remember why the tour was 86th? (laughs) Mike presumes bad sales. And more than that, do you have a theory on why they even decided to book those cities since Georgia's business wasn't doing great? And I don't believe either Oli or Crockett had ever followed their television there before. Any idea if they reached out to the Bruiser in the same way they were working with Jerry Jarrett or Ron Fuller to run joint shows inside their territories? Or is it possible, because of geography, that Jarrett was the one who gave them the green light to run? Uh, None of those things. Um... No, they didn't reach out to Bruiser because at that time, I think Bruiser may have moved to fucking Florida by that point. He was still uh, running. He was still running shows. Was he still running shows? Okay, well then, then he wouldn't have helped him if he was still running shows. Um, Scott Steiner debuted with him a couple of years after that. That's right. That's right. He wasn't. He wasn't still working on most of the shows, but they were still running. And then he moved to what was it? Eighty eight ish. He moved to Florida. Anyway, um, they didn't reach out to Bruiser. Um, they didn't reach out to Jerry Jarrett. He wouldn't have anything to do with Indiana. It's basically as simple as. You don't book these buildings four weeks in advance. In the middle of August, the buildings were probably, let's see, July, June, May, April. I mean, if they were doing anything approaching proper business, um, those buildings were booked in April or May when they were assuming that they were still going to be doing these things. And they probably were trying Indianapolis and Fort Wayne just to try something else up there because they were running the towns that they had been running to death. Um so, no, there it, it was probably just as simple as, and Ronnie West, uh, I think, was working in the office down there, and he probably wanted to reach out to another couple of towns. Um, so there wasn't anything to do with with Bruiser or Jerry Jarrett, and the tour was 86th because, of, yeah, it was fucking dying, and they, I think they had made the decision in Charlotte, let's just not do this anymore. Every time that I worked... <laughs> Every time that I worked based out of Georgia, the I never got fired. The entire territory was closed down. In 83, Ole came in to promos that day and said, let's don't do this anymore. We said, what? He said, any of it. And then three years or five, two years later, in 85, they closed it down again while I was there. And they just said, by the end of, by October 1st, we were in, um, in Charlotte. So, I started looking for an apartment up there at first of September. So they had, yeah, August 17th through 23, they canceled this tour. Then they told the talent, we're all going to Charlotte, October the 1st, be there. And that, cause here's another thing. While I was working Atlanta, the one pain in the ass was I was having on Wednesdays, the last month or so that I was there to drive up to Charlotte, to be there at nine o'clock on Wednesday morning 
and do the regular Charlotte promos that the guys in Atlanta didn't have to do. So if I'd get a day off on a Wednesday, I'd still have to fucking go to Charlotte and, and do promos for six hours for free and a four hour drive each way. So that wasn't a lot of fun. But anyway, and then everything just merged together uh, on October 1st. And by by January, we did the angle with the rock and roll. By February, we were in the ring with them on the house shows and did the biggest business run of our lives. So I was not at all unhappy. We, we, I could have done without renting that extra apartment for three months, but what the fuck? We had a little rest, right? Right. 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 Yeah. But Dusty saw 84 Mid-South and said, how do I get everybody? Yeah. <laughs> how do I get everybody in here, baby? Everybody. And, and that, and that's the thing, you know, it, it just, Atlanta, um, a lot of people assume that Atlanta had been a healthy territory right until Vince took the TV. And that's not true. Atlanta had been hurting for about a year, year and a half. That's how he was able to slip in there and, and, and get the Briscoes and other people to, to sell their stock because the, uh, one of the big things was when they closed the city auditorium, um, Oli's booking in the early eighties in Atlanta was a little off the charts over, you know, he was all over the place, but it, they still had such a great wrestling tradition. But when they had closed the city auditorium, which was what 79, 80 thereabouts, the only place they had to run was the Omni in the whole town. The city auditorium was where they could go weekly and then do one Omni show at the big building a month. But they couldn't go weekly at the Omni. They couldn't afford the rent, and you couldn't put that, you know, you couldn't fill it. So they were left with running the Omni every two or three weeks and doing bigger shows, which cost more and had to bring more guys in. And then business had started to go down anyway. And Barnett was disinterested. And that's how, when I heard when we first got there, um, that Ole had broke into. Uh, Barnett's office while Barnett was in Hong Kong getting a new wardrobe made and looked at the books and got enough evidence that he was messing around with the money that he was only was able to go to the other stockholders in the company and say, Barnett's fucking us. Barnett's defense was that he put money in it all the time or found money to put in it when it was bad. So he took some of the money out of it when it was good. <laughs> but once they lost Barnett, you know, Ole was great at just running the wrestling business, but he wasn't personal friends with the goddamn president. He didn't know all those people, and he d uh, was not the darling of Ted Turner that got, you know, wrestling on his station and saved uh, the promotion and all that stuff in years before. So uh, Georgia 83-ish was rocky, and business was not great, and that's how Vince was able to take advantage. Well, plus there was plus resentment. a lot of people owned it. A lot of people owned a piece of Atlanta. Well, that's it, it. What, he could he couldn't get into the Carolinas because nobody owned it but the Crockets. He couldn't get into fucking Mid South because nobody owned it but Watts. He couldn't get into Dallas because the Von Erichs owned it. But because of that war ten years earlier, there had been so much split in ownership, and so many pieces were out there that he was able to take Georgia. And again, the sale from Watts to Ole happened behind the back of the Briscoes. And it was That's really right. yeah. Ole partnering up with Fred Ward and Ralph Freed that became like the, the power group. And they pushed Barnett out. You know, that wasn't like, hey, Jack and Jerry, we're going to push Barnett out. Are you OK with this? No, they just did it. <laughs> and that turned around and bit Ole because when Ole complained about the Briscoes selling the stock to Vince McMahon without him having knowledge of it, they said, well, that's the same thing that happened with Bill Watts in the stock. And he yeah. came back to bite him. And I mean, that's really the big thing. The decisions of Ole Anderson, like pushing Barnett out right into the arms of the McMahons when they need someone because they're going to be expanding their television portfolio. It was perfect timing, but the fact that it was Ole and Ole couldn't get along with the Briscoes. Ole couldn't get along with his other partners other than Fred Ward. And they weren't going to go to battle with him. And all the boys couldn't stand Fred Ward and Ralph Freed. They called him Rooster. 
Frank Morrell one time said, Ralph Reed is not the kind of guy you want to beat up. He's the kind of guy you want to slap down and piss on in front of the boys. But anyway, the son-in-law promoter. The, the son-in-law promoter. How many times have we heard that phrase, the son-in-law promoter? Oh, anyway, you know what could have saved the whole day in Georgia? If only Anderson had been a nicer person and easier to get along with, maybe Vince McMahon would have never been able to take over the wrestling world. And I know what would have been able to be done to Ole Anderson Bryan last where he would have been nicer. You know what made Ole look so mean and so cranky? It was those big sideburns, those big mutton chops. <laughs> I didn't know where it, you were going. All right. That's exactly right. Because back in, in the in the days of the lumber camps in Minnesota and amongst those Norsemen, uh, those big mutton chop sideburns were a big deal. But if somebody had held Ole down and shaved those off and you saw the baby face under there, the clean shaven baby face, smiling face of Ole Anderson, the whole face of modern wrestling would have changed entirely and if if manscaped had been around when ole anderson had those big sideburns none of this would have ever happened folks because manscaped would have been able to to make even ole anderson look not only as smooth and and shiny as a baby's butt but also friendly and pleasant and kind and and even humble and lovable don't you agree brian no, I mean, I think Manscaped is great. <laughs> oh, no. They called him Rock Rogowski for a reason. His face looked like a rock. <laughs> well, if you can't get whiskers off a of rock, you can get whiskers off of everything else with the Manscaped Lawnmower 3.0, folks. A premium electric trimmer that's designed to give you a confidence boost through body image. There is no reason now to feel bad when you go, if you do go out in public these days. Because you you feel like that people can see through your clothes and know that that your your goddamn crotch is the Amazonian rainforest, and that you've got enough hair going down the crack of your ass that it could be braided and sold to children as toys. But the lawnmower 3.0 is waterproof. It's nick proof. You're not going to cut the fellas. You're not going to cut the boys. You're not going to you're not going to nick those sensitive wrinkled areas. In betwixt uh, left thigh and right thigh, and in the front of the taint, and in the back of the dick. There's a lot of wrinkles down there. Oh. The lawnmower 3.0 will make the hair magically disappear without shedding any blood. Also, they got the Shears 2.0, the luxury four-piece nail kit with tweezers, scissors, fingernail clippers, and a nail file. You'll find the crop preserver on their website. That's manscaped.com. It's an anti-chafing ball deodorant and moisturizer that helps you tame summer swamp ass. Uh, the Crop Reviver, it's a testicle toner. It's like having cologne for your, for your balls, your little BBs. If anybody's going to be down there sniffing, you need to go to manscaped.com. And I'll tell you another thing here. The Lawnmower 3.0 will prevent your significant other from having a fur ball surgically removed from their stomach. I'll tell you that right now. So anyway, go to manscaped.com. Check out some of these life-changing products. You'll smell better. You'll feel better. People will thank you in your close, immediate social circle for giving their, their nose, their tongue, their fingers, and everything else a, a fucking rest. Anyway, go to manscaped.com. Listeners of this show will get 20% off your purchase and free shipping with the code DRIVE. 20% off and free shipping with the code DRIVE at manscaped.com. Grab 2020 by the horns. Shave that front trunk. That's what they say. I didn't know you had a trunk in the front. I got a dick in the front and a trunk in the back. I can't believe you're going to make me talk about this, but the way the elephant has a trunk, that's the way... Oh, the, that trunk. Yeah. I thought they meant shit that you keep, you know, fucking various items that you might need on a trip in. That's my trunk. That's in the back. I don't have one in the front. Well, All right. regardless of whether you're business in the front and party in the back or whatever you are, you can you can be slickered and come on a gold tooth from top to bottom with Manscaped. <sighs> the things we do. You see Keith Lee. 
Oh, boy. You know, we just put up the drive through where we reviewed NXT TakeOver. And it's been brought up to me several times since that wonderful Tuesday afternoon the show went up that I said on there, just watch how they'll screw him up on Raw. I had no idea it would already have happened by the time the show came out. They did it in record time this time. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> okay, we we have mostly praised Keith Lee for almost everything physical, right? Most of his matches, the, the match with him and Karrion Cross last week didn't come together as probably my least favorite of Keith Lee's matches that I've seen. Part of that may have had to do with Cross hurting his shoulder and it being, you know, a problem in the last minutes of the thing. By the way, apparently, I'm a goddamn savant. That was as plain as to me as the goddamn wart on the Wicked Witch of the West knows his face that he hurt his shoulder and you could see that not a mile away and everybody on Twitter was like, oh, Cornette saw it. Cornette called it. How could we have known? How could you not fucking know? He's he's not using it. He's holding it in. There's a giant knot on it. What the fuck? Anyway. Hey, real quick on that, though. And we're going to review NXT on the drive through this week with AEW, as well as some questions, I presume. But he vacated the NXT championship. How long does someone typically have to be out when they separate their shoulder? Well, I, you know, it depends. Is it a... If it's a bad enough separation, it it needs surgery. Um, Orton's gone through that in the past. If it's just a regular old separated shoulder, some of these fucking freaks of nature, and I'm sure this guy's driven, he might be back in four to six weeks. It just, it, but the, you know, it. I'm not a doctor and I don't play one on television, so it can be all over the page. Uh, but boy, they can't keep a motherfucker as champion, can they? It's like as that belt is cursed. Keith Lee forfeits it. They go to all this trouble to name the new champion. The new champion gets hurt in the goddamn match where he's going to be crowned and then has to immediately turn it over as soon as he wins it. And now what they're going to have. Well, no, he are, beat Keith are, Lee for the title. You're thinking of the North American title. Oh, he, wait. Oh, he vacated God, the North American all title. All right. Okay, shit. I'm sorry. You're right. Yes, he vacated the North American title. They go through all that and fill that, and one of those guys got hurt before it was over with. Then the fucking title that Keith Lee kept, he then loses to Karrion Cross, who gets hurt in the fucking... You know what this means, don't you? There's too many fucking champions. And now they're going to have some kind of goddamn clusterfuck, multi-man... The scaffold match, bungee jump over the Colorado Ritter, River, Snake River Canyon fucking stipulation deal to fill this title now, right? It's a four man, the four men being Gargano, Ciampa, Adam Cole, and Finn Bauer, a four man, 60 minute Iron Man match. <sighs> okay, wait, why is Gar? I guess Gargano's in there because he, he, he's got good cardio and he can take everybody else's moves. And he's but a former champion. Man. They're all former NXT champions. Johnny, same face. Where's Champa been? Why have they not been featuring Champa? We've been watching NXT for weeks, and where's Champa been? Well, he returned on this week's show, which you'll see before we review it. On okay, he returned. That does not answer the question of where he's been. That indicates that he's back, but it doesn't tell me where he's been. I have no idea where he's been. If he was available to them, they're putting goddamn some of the talent they've been putting on that show, and they're not using Tommaso Champa. Or I, I all right. Anyway, the point is, and we see this on SummerSlam, and, and I don't want to preview the review, but every goddamn match practically was not only for a title, but it was for another version of someone else's title. Well, this guy's the champion, huh, the Raw champion, no, the Universal champion. Well, these are the tag team champions. Which ones? Oh, the Raw tag team champions, not the tag team champions on Smack. It, it, it can't even be world title. North American title, intercontinental title, whatever. It's got to be just different versions of everybody's the world fucking champion. And it's, and you can't keep track of it. And now with NXT, it's even worse. And all these titles being dropped and vacated and whatever. Getting back to Keith Lee. What in the flying fuck? What in the wide, wide world of sports? They thought... 
I, as I said, we've been putting Keith Lee over for his matches and his moves and his athleticism and the way he can move that fucking weight. And he's in his mid thirties. He's a physical freak. I said, I hate the fucking promos. He sounds like Dr. Frazier crane. Sounds like a goddamn clinical psychologist. He doesn't, he looks intimidating as all hell and, and sounds almost pleasant and friendly and sing song. And then what was it week before last? Somebody pissed him off and he cut a fucking promo that I said sounded like it ought to have been on mid South wrestling in the eighties. Had some based his voice, got mad. We're going to do that's the fucking Keith Lee. I want to see. I'm thinking, okay, that's what they're bringing to the main roster. This fucking badass that can do all this shit. Huge can work and fucking as Ernie Ladd would say, talks like he covers the ground he walks on. What we got on Raw, he actually said greetings and salutations. We got a fucking giant 375-pound man wearing a hoodie and a fucking skirt <laughs> that, that makes Paul Lind sound like a badass. <laughs> oh, come on. Look up Uncle <laughs> Arthur on Bewitched, young young people. He, this was the goddamn most physically and verbally unintimidating promo since the last time that Richard Simmons got mad at his mailman. He was going the other way to be a, a very articulate and pleasant person. It was like somebody kicked him in the balls. His voice is three octaves higher. And did I mention he's wearing what appears to be a skirt? What? Yeah, he was dressed like a divorcee playing tennis. Yes. <laughs> he was dressed That's like a, it. it was a tennis skirt. Yeah. A tennis skirt and a fucking hoodie. And then he took the hoodie off, but he's still got a shirt. What? They've changed his music. They changed his fucking dress. He shaved. And I, I don't even mean his his manner of dress, but they literally put him in a dress. <laughs> they had him shave. It, new look. That's right. That that I didn't even notice that. I thought he looked cleaner somehow, or b b even more baby face. He shaved too. And then, okay, let's uh, appearances are subject to you know people's personal interpretation. Let's look at the facts this new talent that went literally as far as anyone could go in NXT simultaneously holding both championships. NXT is no longer doing spot shows in Florida. Only they are on national television. People have seen this fucking guy. Am I right? Am I speaking facts? You are right. He's been on national television for months now. The way he dresses, the way he talks, the way he works, the things he's done. He comes to a television program on another cable network. This program currently doing charitably two and a half times the viewership of the program he's left. So it's not like a goddamn difference between local television in Cleveland and NBC. They not only change his look, not only change his dress, not only change his music, but also when he challenges a top star, Randy Orton, the most physically dominant guy from this other promotion, challenges Randy Orton, wrestles for a few minutes with Randy Orton, then Drew McIntyre interferes and fucking pulls Randy Orton out of the fucking deal and goddamn it, they get into it. Where'd Keith Lee go? He disappeared like Tommaso Ciampa in NXT. <laughs> it's hard to make a 375-pound man disappear into thin air, but they did it. So the, the, the guy who viewers can be excused for thinking is the biggest star and the most accomplished man in the history of NXT gets a match on Raw with Randy Orton. It's competitive for three or four minutes. And then somebody else interferes, and this guy's never seen or heard of again. He doesn't win his debut on this television show. If he can't beat Randy Orton, put him against somebody else he can beat. 
If he can't beat anybody, don't put him in a match. It's a work. You can do whatever you want. Have him come out and challenge people and they don't want to fucking get in the ring with him because he's such a big fucking badass. Or, more importantly, just do what you're supposed to do. Have him challenge a star. Have him wrestle the star. Have him beat the fucking star. That's how he becomes a star. That's how he gets over. Just exposing him on this television program for a few minutes, like, oh, well, we gave him an interview and he had a match with Randy and he went four minutes without getting beat before he disappeared because he's such a dickless pussy that somebody interferes in his big raw television debut and he doesn't immediately go after that motherfucker. He just tucks his head and tail between his legs and wanders off like Dr. Frazier Crane, not the Incredible Hulk. It's a work. You can do anything you want. So therefore, if you ain't going to fucking debut the guy and give him a big win and put him over, don't do it at all. What the... F I, that is the stupidest thing I've ever seen. If it was... If it was some little guy... Bring him in, let him be competitive with Randy, sure, and then and then he sells and gets sympathy, and then Randy fucks him, and then Drew McIntyre comes to his rescue. But fucking hell, what uh, there is show me one time in the history of professional wrestling, and I will say this and then I'll be done with it. One instance in the history of professional wrestling where a guy became a star by debuting against a star that he then not only didn't beat, but just disappeared when the, the actual stars got to fight. Fuck. Jesus Christ. Am I, am I misrepresenting this to the people? No. To the people out there? You're very, very correct. And it's not just any Raw. It's the Raw after a major pay-per-view. There's always a bump for that. So it's a bigger audience than Raw's been getting for a while. People have seen Keith Lee. He was in the Royal Rumble, and they bring him in, and he runs right into that wall known as Vince McMahon. Well, I mean, well, I mean, after the after the interview, you know, nobody wanted to see him anyway because it was so goddamn. I did it. It was like a Disney movie. The, it, it, he does. He looks like that and cuts a promo like he should be the fucking. Big Brother Bear in a Disney movie. Like he's blue. Oh, it's some honey. I don't. Are we scared now to have any intimidating badasses on television for fear someone might have nightmares? I don't know. Anyway, point is if anybody hadn't seen Keith Lee before, they never wanted to see him again after that. After the fucking promo he did. It, it it was sounded to me like a lot of people would probably hope Randy Orton just kicks him in the fucking mouth and shuts him up because that was a goddamn disgraceful fucking promo, not for a college classroom, but for a challenge to a fight. That was the most unintimidating interview I've ever heard. And, you know, it's, it's hard to, it's hard to dismiss the physical capabilities of a giant 375 pound man, except when they're wearing a tennis skirt. So why didn't they just fucking throw him in the fucking pond out back and, and just kill him quick instead of embarrassing him first? I don't know. Sometimes I want to just tune this stuff out, Brian. Sometimes I just want to block out the outside world so I don't have to hear these rotten promos or see this bad booking. Do you have any idea what could help me block out the outside world and just listen to and experience what I want to listen to and experience? I do, because I caught this transition in time. You can only be talking about Raycon. That's exactly right. I'm talking about the Raycon earbuds, and thank you for picking up on my segue. Oh, great segue last. Uh, <laughs> folks, we've been talking about them for ages. Everybody needs a great pair of wireless earbuds. Before you spend hundreds and hundreds of dollars, check out Raycon, R-A-Y-C-O-N, Raycon. That's the earbuds you need. Go to buyraycon, B-U-Y-R-A-Y-C-O-N.com and check them out. They're cheaper than the top audio brands, but they sound just as amazing. They're probably half the price of this 
big highfalutin stuff, and they give you the same quality. The Everyday E25 earbuds, the best ones yet. It pairs up with Bluetooth if you've got blue teeth. Gives you more bass, a compact design, a nice noise isolating fit. Stacy wanders around the house now talking to people. I don't know who the fuck they are. She hears the voices. I don't. I talk to her. She doesn't hear me. She's happy as a clam. Um, You can do conference calls. You can binge on your podcast. You can sit in bed with your significant other. You don't have to keep turning the volume up because it's in your head. Stylish and discreet, no dangling wires or stems. I don't know how else to explain to you that you need this stuff in your life. They sound like a million dollars, but they don't look like it. They're not dirty, green, and wrinkled. Folks, now is the time to get the latest and greatest from Raycon and get 15% off your order. Buyraycon.com. I spelled it earlier. Buyraycon.com slash JCE. 15% off. You save that money if you slash JCE at buyraycon.com. Amazing stuff. You you can't even hear your children screaming and crying when you have these in, you told me. I never told you that. You I, told me that I, you said I, I, I cannot. Always, I always hear them You screaming said and I crying. cannot block <laughs> these kids out from screaming and crying, except when I put my ear raycon wireless earbuds in my head and then they can scream and cry bloody murder and it doesn't bother me a bit that's what you said that to is me. not accurate although i will say because i love my raycon earbuds and suzanne has a pair that she stole from me the kids now want their own so i'm going to be buying a couple more pairs in the next few weeks i think you just ought to lock the kids in a closet that way you wouldn't be able to hear them this is why it's so good that you don't have kids Well, see, people should know their limitations. (laughs) A lot of people's, well, no, seriously. I have no children because I'm not a person that needs to have children. And I recognize that fact. Too many people don't recognize that they're people that should not have children. As well, people, people ask, would Cornette, why don't you run for office? You're so, yeah, I've got, you're so opinionated. I've got the opinion that I'm not qualified to run for office. Unfortunately, the, most of the people that run for office don't have that same opinion of themselves, and they should. Smart man knows his limitations. Speaking of your limitations, what the fuck are you doing this week? There are no limitations at all on the Arcadian Vanguard podcast. You mean you're network. limitless? You're limitless. limitless? That's right. Who's... Which wrestler calls himself limitless? Now I can't even Keith, remember. Keith Lee. Is it Keith Lee? I forget. <laughs> He's limitless. We can bask in his glory. We can bask in his fucking soprano fucking voice, too. I think we've seen his limits. It sounds as threatening as Tabitha Stevens on Bewitched. That's now multiple Bewitched comments. Well, it, it, it was on Actually, my mind. Both Bewitched comments related to Keith Lee, now that I think yes, about it. Yes, because it's on my mind. He sa- he makes Paul Lind sound fucking uh, uh, like a badass, and he sounds more like Tabitha Stevens. All right. Well, if you're done, Dr. Bombay, I'll get back to... Yeah. Well, emergency, about- come right away to the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network, where you will hear this week... We'll get information about all the shows on Twitter, at Super Podcasts, or on Facebook, facebook.com slash Arcadian Vanguard. Want to make mention... Charting the Territories, Al Getz and John Boucher. The newest episode is up right now. A deep dive look into 1961 Leroy McGurk wrestling. Find out about characters you've never heard. Actually, they talked about Happy Humphrey on the show this week, which is interesting because we talk about Happy Humphrey and Haystack Calhoun this week on the show. Haystack Calhoun gets mentioned on WWE TV. And now Happy Humphrey on charting the territories. So everybody's got to copy us, is what you're saying. That's right, but check this show out today. If you are a wrestling history buff, if you enjoy classic wrestling talk, this is the show for you. They do a great job. Chartingthepodcast.com are available wherever you find your favorite podcasts. Also want to make mention of Stick to Wrestling with John McAdam, the most recent episode. Answered questions such as, what if Tully and Arn do not leave the NWA in 1988? What if Ric Flair leaves in 1988? What happens if Jerry Jarrett buys the AWA? What if Austin Idol takes the Hulk Hogan spot in 1983? 
And of course, we mentioned this one earlier. What if Bill Watts gets the TBS time slot instead of Jim Crockett? Find out the answers to all those questions and many more at mcadampod.com, available wherever you find your favorite podcast. And of course, the 605 Super Podcast, The Mothership! <laughs> Who does that crying sound represent? My screaming and crying children, or... No, me! Me! Oh. Me! me. Well, when this show comes out, the Jim Cornette Experience, it is Friday. I believe the newest episode of the 605 Super Podcast will be out tomorrow. Go to 605pod.com. It's also available wherever you find your favorite podcast. Jeff Winningham on Houston Wrestling. Brad Baluchian on the Iron Sheik. Steve Verrier on Gene Kaniski. And Bertrand e. Bear on the life and times of Andre the Giant. Plus many more surprises including Howard Baum's Day with Pat Patterson, and much, much more. Not date, but day with Pat Patterson. 605pod.com, available wherever you find your favorite podcasts. The The Mothership. mothership. The Mothership. The Mothership. That's right. Well, Mother, (laughs) is it time to talk about SummerSlam? Or Mother's. Or my, let's talk about some mothers. I'd rather talk about some mothers than SummerSlam. Let's talk about the, oh, the mother of all SummerSlams. This wasn't it. Because of Bill Cosby, I can never watch Mother Jugs and Speed ever again. <laughs> if, you, if you liked that movie before you found out that Bill Cosby was a rapist, you've got problems. Raquel Welch, come on. Oh, for head. Then watch 1 million BC and get, and get over it. Okay. <laughs> No, no, this is not a laughing matter. This is this is SummerSlam. This is the number two show of the year, right? This is the second biggest wrestling event of the year from the biggest wrestling promotion in the world. Is SummerSlam bigger than the Royal Rumble? They always treated SummerSlam like the number two show, did they not? I guess so. Yeah, well, that tradition has come to an end i guess (laughs) all right um i'm gonna let you start the SummerSlam review with your thoughts on the opening match bailey and oscar what did you think brian last hold hold on hold on before we play this game again do not tell me you fast forwarded the opening match oh yes i did come on you even said you like bailey you even said you like bailey and here is exactly what i wrote I like Bailey, but Riho ruined Japanese women wrestlers for oh, me. Oh, that's ridiculous. That is so ridiculous. As well as the screeching promos from Asuka that sound like the Japanese sailor that was found stuck on Gilligan's Island, played by great character actor Vito Scotti, by the way. Um, And they went 20 fucking minutes. So, yes, I fast-forwarded that this is the biggest show of the year, and they give me the fucking girls to open up and go 20 minutes. First of all, it was a good match. Second of all, Bailey and, and Sasha together are fantastic. Third of all, Asuka is Well, Bailey and Sasha wasn't together. It was Bailey and Asuka. No, but as a unit, they come out together. They're a team. Well, I don't, I'm not getting into the business of Bailey and Sasha's units. Asuka, I'm just talking about their wrestling. Asuka is a great wrestler. Beautiful. She's fantastic what? in the ring. Beautiful. Beautiful. Fantastic she's, in the she's, ring. She's painted up like some kid dropped their snow cone on her face. Well, you got to look past the bad makeup. We've seen her <laughs> in the past without the green eyeshadow, whatever the fuck's going on. Riho shouldn't change the way you see capable and talented Japanese women's wrestlers. Every time now, that thanks to AEW, that I see a Japanese women's wrestler, I am put in mind of the various parade of insignificant schoolgirls that they have fucking trotted out and brought forth, and it just, it's, it's, it's gave me a bad taste. Look, if you want to say you don't like Riho, and I wasn't crazy about Riho either, I completely understand that, and I could even agree with it. If you want to say you didn't like Emi Sakura... Oh, I, I, for, I forgot about the fucking uh, female Freddie Mercury. Coming out with, with a mustache. mustache, yeah. I completely agree with you, and I agree with you. There are talented wrestlers. Look, you've watched, and I'm sure enjoyed, all Japan women's wrestling in the past. 
in the past. You can't just label them all because of Riho the same Actually, way. I, I'm not labeling all of I'm just saying that I got turned off with fucking small, minute fucking Japanese women wrestlers screaming and screeching in stereotypical fucking language. Asuka isn't small and minute. She's smaller than Bailey. Well, Bailey's big. Bailey, <laughs> Goddamn, she's a Bailey the Bruiser. She's fucking huge. She's just plain large. I'm going to ask you right now. Did you fast forward the Asuka-Sasha Banks match later on? We ain't got there yet. Did you fast forward that match? We ain't got there yet. I'm there now. Well, well you're going to have to back up because I ain't there yet. Of all the women's matches, the fast, well, whatever. It was a good match. Bailey won. You lost. You lost yeah. out on a good match, Jim Cornette. I'm suitably chastened. The interview after that was Dominic Mysterio. Think about this now. They're calling him Dominic Mysterio. Since they've gone all this far with it, His uh, Rey Mysterio's wife, Angie, is out there. Couldn't they have just used his fucking real last name, Dominic, at this point? Well, Do you think, well, is it on his birth certificate, Dominic Mysterio? Well, a couple of things. One is I think it's regrettable if he's ever going to want to wrestle anywhere else that he wrestled in WWE first as Dominic Mysterio. Yeah. Because they'll try to mess with him over his name. Second of all, and I feel bad about this because after the terrific Oscar Bailey match, I pressed mute. I didn't really need to see this promo. I had something else going on. I had it on in the background. Uh... So I didn't hear what was said. I... <laughs> Again, <laughs> I feel bad hearing you say this. I thought it was Ray's mother. I didn't realize it was Ray's wife. No. She looked a lot older than Ray. Yeah. So I, I thought, it's so you see, said it because I didn't pay attention to the promo. And actually, now that I think about it, during the match, they did probably say wife. I thought it was Dominic's grandmother. You see where Dominic got his size. Yeah. And I like Ray Mysterio. I think Ray Mysterio is a special talent. One I've, I've worked with him a number of times. Great guy. But this whole visual is weird because the son looks like the father, and the father looks like the son, and the mother looks like the grandmother. She's the biggest one of the bunch of them. Um, but it, as far as Dominic goes here in this interview, I felt bad for him because it was scripted like all these other WWE promos, and the poor kid had to recite the lines basically with no feeling or emotion like he was a speaker at the Republican National Convention. Um, and it was all the right material, but it was obviously not his words, and, and he wasn't comfortable delivering them. Like, none of these people are comfortable delivering these fucking stilted promos. Anyway, it was better than what was to come. For the Raw version, I believe it was the Raw version of the tag team title, the Street Profits took on Andre and Garza with Selena Vega. Have the Street Profits and Private Party ever been seen in the same room at the same time? Not that I'm aware of. Well, and actually, hopefully, they never will be. It's the same fucking gimmick. On both fucking channels. I guess Street Profits were first because AEW is newer. I don't know, but Street Profits outfits are much more expensive and look just as goofy as private parties. It's like private party is the Street Profits junior high school picture. They're takeoffs on basketball uniforms and they look fucking horrid. Um... I don't know. I, I, I'm i sure I, we've seen Street Profits a time or two before. I probably zipped through it. But I watched this match uh, to my everlasting dismay. Within 30 seconds, Montez Ford proved he can't hit the fucking ropes. Did you see that? I missed that. The first time he hit the ropes, he looked like he was, he looked like he was running toward barbed wire that was on fire. I don't know what the <laughs> fuck. And then... <laughs> the Street Profits hit not only a sloppy flapjack, but a reckless flapjack. Um, and I guess they've seen it on television and just decided to do it. And a lot of people out there, oh, now Cornette's telling these guys like Cornette's ever done a flap. I invented the fucking flapjack, you morons. And so I got the right to, criti to critique it. And this was not the way they were too far apart. 
they grabbed the guy's leg so low and boosted him up, and then they both fell at different at different stages in different directions. It, 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 you're supposed to be tight, shoulder to shoulder. Each one of you grabs a fucking thigh. The guy puts his hand, one on each shoulder in the middle. You boost him straight up, and then you take it back, and you go back at approximately the same pace. Now, Stan and Bobby could not take the exact same kind of flat back bump because it wasn't natural to both of them. So there was a little variation in how they went down, but they went down closer together and fucking with more control of the guy. And you always tell the guy, don't reach out and take it on your hands. You'll break your wrist. Take it on the goddamn forearms. So you've got a pad or, or a shoulder and turn your fucking head to the side or whatever, but they just launched this guy. Anyway, um, I wrote, I didn't, I wasn't for sure if Andrade and Garza are good or just looked good by comparison. And then my next line was check that it's just by comparison. Cause then they started doing the backslap tags. Nobody even tries anymore. Montez Ford looked like he had never sold before in his life. And he doesn't look like he's easy to move around or easy to work with. He got a hot tag in quotation mark to, to Dawkins who made a decent comeback, but his outfit, he looks like somebody that wandered in out of a fucking playground ball game in that outfit. And then at that point, they did a double knockout and simultaneous cold tags for no fucking reason. Ford has a nice top rope cross body. That's another thing. You got Mark Quinn on one team. You've got Montez Ford on the other team. They both have that tremendous hang time and the leaping and everything, but their fundamentals are all shot. And I'll say the same thing about this Montez Ford. I said about Mark Quinn, except I think Mark Quinn is much superior to Montez Ford because I said they need to be in a great training program to get their basics so that the, the athleticism is not the only thing they're doing that their shit actually looks good. But then I realized Montez Ford Seems like he would have been in a great training program, so apparently he's hopeless. Mark Quinn, I think, is still, you know, could make it. Anyway, um, one of the heels I, I didn't catch, I didn't write down who completely missed the double foot stomp to the head of Montez Ford. Did you see that when he landed beside of him and fell backwards and Ford sold it a second later? Like, oh, shit. Um... They did another babyface tag. They, after the heat, then they just start tagging whenever it's just convenient to do a spot. I've never seen so many babyface tags after a fucking comeback. Um, Dawkins did some sloppy something, and then Ford slipped off the ropes two or three times before he finally hit a turnaround sloppy splash off the top rope. And they won. Absolutely fucking rotten. What the fuck was that all about? That did, needed to be on SummerSlam? They don't have two other tag teams in the whole company that could have had a tag team match any better than that, that that needed to be on SummerSlam. I didn't think it was as bad as you did, although certainly not perfect. They don't have too many good tag teams, if that was part of your question there. I'm a big fan of Garza. I think Garza's a star. I think he carries himself like a star. I think he's good in the ring. I think Andrade's good in the ring. The jury's still out on... I was about to say the Street Profits. Are they Street Profits? They're the Street Profits. Yeah. The jury's still out on them. What, what, jury, what more evidence do you need? I'll bring some more. Zelina Vega is fantastic. She's good. She's fantastic. She is really good. And, uh, you know, it was what it was. <sighs> Moving along. The next match, the one we've all been waiting for. What's the stipulation? We don't know. Is it hair versus hair? No, they changed it. It's loser leave WWE, Sonya Deville and Mandy Rose. And I did not fast forward through this because obviously everybody's waiting, including me, to see what the fuck's going to go on, what's going to happen all the news, et cetera, et cetera. So naturally, Brian, I would not skip through this match. Well, that's a good thing. I will say... And I'm blaming you that I had to watch this. Well, hold on, hold on, and then I'll take all the blame you want. I want to say, because we brought up, I guess it would have been on the drive-thru, the change in stipulation 
from hair versus hair to loser leaves town. Yes. And you wondered exactly why, even if she's leaving, why would she not want to get potentially a payoff? Why would she not do the head shaving? You and I disagree. We have an answer for this now, according to the internet. According to the internet, we do. You and I disagreed a little bit about some of the reasoning for Sonya Deville taking a hiatus, but apparently it was her lawyer who said, do not shave your head and then have to go to court with a shaved head. Okay, that makes littler sense than any of the stupid things that we've talked about so far in this program. Of all of those, this ma- that makes less sense than any of it. Do you know why? why? Is this not obvious? Why? She didn't do anything wrong. She's not on trial. The, 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 this is an open and shut case. They have this guy on video breaking in the house. The cops caught him on the spot red-handed with the fucking burglary and kidnapping tools. He's made statements on social media he's going to do this. He actually admitted what he was going to fucking do. If there was ever an open and shut case, this is it. What difference does it make whether Sonya Deville looks like Zsa Zsa Gabor or Zippy the Pinhead? She's the offended party here, the wronged victim. She doesn't need to look anyway. This fucking cretin that broke in her fucking house. He looks like he's going to go to jail for a long time. But why would it make any difference what Sonya Deville looks like in court when she was the victim? Yes, when you've got some fucking goof with tattoos on his fucking face or goddamn the weird things they have hanging out of their fucking nose and ears these days or whatever. Yeah, that guy needs to go to jail. But not the the defendant, not the fucking victim. So what difference does it make what she looks like going to court when she didn't do anything wrong? This is the question I'm asking you. The difference between getting a haircut and coming in as a skinhead. They could even play the tape. See, she got her head (laughs) shaped on pay-per-view. Hey, this whole thing's (laughs) fucked up. This whole thing's fucked up. And it, 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 you know, it's not a big deal because... It's just that nobody believes these stipulations anyway. If this had happened 20 years ago and then somebody didn't get to see the girl get their head shaved, they would have set seats on fire. It would have fucking hurt business. It would have been a goddamn big big deal. But now nobody believes this shit anyway. They probably don't believe she's leaving the WWE, whether she is or not. Because they've uh, prostituted all this shit anyway. All the stipulations, nothing is ever adhered to. But... uh, I would love to have seen Vince's face when somebody came up to him and said she can't shave her head because uh, the lawyer said no. And he's like, we've advertised this, pal. And then when I guess when he found out she was going to quit the fucking business over this, I'm sure he probably his head exploded. No wonder he looks so old these days. Having to deal with people like this. It was probably easier in the old days when they were all fucking maniacs and crackpots and quit over bad payoffs and walked out over not wanting to do a job. Please, he has no idea where he is. He probably had to be reminded who they were. Uh, anyway, so that's why they did, we didn't have a head shaving. We had a loser leave because apparently Sonya Deville has decided she's going to quit the business because this is... St- and I don't blame her for being upset over this incident. It's be a very fucking uh, 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 nerve-wracking incident. But here's where they've made their mistake. Okay, change the stipulation because she can't go to court bald. Fine. Like I said, nobody believes them anyway. It's all fucking garbage at this point. But to announce then we're going to make it a loser leave and box themselves into a corner? Well, they're not boxing themselves into anything because they just won't honor the stipulation, which will make, once again, further in the future when she does, when she calms back, calms down over this and comes back in about a month or six weeks, if they let her even come back that quick, And then it'll just be another garbage stipulation and another reason for people not to believe the advertising. They should have just went in and had the match, whether it's hair versus they could have come up with another stipulation or whatever the fuck and just hurt her and let her go and be gone as long as she wants to. But when she finally realizes, okay, I've done it. I quit the business four times in 1984. Ford in the first half of 1984. I quit the business in Tulsa the night we wrestled Bill Watts. I had decided before he even made his comeback that if I made it to the locker room alive, 
that I was going back home to Louisville. <clears throat> I, I, I got in over my head. But after we fucking fought back and fucking okay, didn't get stabbed, get back to the hotel, get a fucking pizza, good night's rest, get the check, okay. I quit. The second night I quit in Tulsa, when we had the fucking riot that they had to bring the internal affairs investigators in to investigate the police brutality of the, trying to save our lives. They were nightsticking people left and right. And I was, and, and I was fucking bleeding from both sides of my nose. I said, I, I can't do this. I can't, my nerves, my nerves get back in the car, start joking with the boys, get a fucking pizza, get the check. I quit the business instead of going to jail. The first time I went to jail, didn't get arrested on the spot. They filed after I whacked the guy in the head. We got away and they filed papers. I had to go turn myself in Little Rock, Arkansas. <laughs> I told Grizzly Smith, I said, Little Rock's only fucking 500 miles from Louisville. I believe I'll go to Louisville before I go to jail. He said, I'll go with you. You'll be in and out in an hour. And he did and I was. Was there a yes. pizza? Did you get a pizza after that one? When I got back home, I did. <laughs> And I'm not even going into the fucking, in this situation, since we're talking about Sonya Deville, I'm not even talking about the potential for, you know, fucking rats after the matches that definitely calmed your fucking nerves down. Uh, but she, it's not going to, if she's going to quit the fucking business for good when she was a star on television making this money and all of a sudden I'm just going to do something different after all this work. She may believe that now, but she might change her mind here in the next little while, in which case they should have left the fucking door open. That's all I'm saying. Anyway. It's oh, Joy! It's, it's wrestling. The door's open. I saw Terry Funk retire once in person and multiple right, other I, times on tape. I know, but just, you know. <sighs> anyway, we have a girls' grudge match here. Um, They fought sloppily all around ringside um i've not seen either of these two girls work before so i don't know whether it looks like sonia deville has some potential or some something or whether i think this was a style clash plus they're trying to have a grudge match instead of wrestle and girls having a grudge fight is just <sighs> I, 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 mandy rose is too pretty to have a grudge match. She spent 15 minutes setting a fucking table up because she wasn't big enough to lift it. Sonya Deville gut shots her twice with a chair, rams her face into the fucking desk four times, didn't mess her makeup up. There's girls using chairs and tables and then continuing on, which just basically makes it fake when the guys do it. It doesn't do anything because the people are going, well, anybody that gives a shit are going, oh, fuck, girls with tables and chairs. And... It just diminishes it when the guys do it because they're 120 pounds. They're getting hit with these chairs and bashed into tables and it's still okay. Um, I, I wrote Mandy Rose would be a champion in the AEW women's division. But anyway, um, Sonya Deville against Rhea Ripley or Charlotte, I might buy, but I wrote, this is not Gail Kim versus awesome Kong. Uh, it's not that I just don't like women's matches. I just only like the really good women's matches, and those only occur at the top. Uh, if they had tried to wrestle, this might have worked, but they're trying to work like guys having a grudge fight, and it's fucking awful to watch girls do these things. And then Mandy Rose hit a bunch of knees and beat her, and this took for fucking ever. Was this a great girls match, Brian, last? I just haven't seen a lot of them. I so. wouldn't say it was a great girls match. You know, what took me out of the match, and I was impressed by Sonya Deville. I think she has something. But knowing that, A, they're best friends, <laughs> and B, knowing the result. I had no doubt in my mind who was leaving town. Well, yeah. That took me out of the match. But watching these two girls, again, it's one thing to think like, oh, I bet, you know, Randy Orton and Drew McIntyre are actually friends. It's another thing when you know for a fact that they're best friends. Yeah, they just had a sleepover on the national news. Yeah, so that took me out of it, and um, and then we got to see Otis celebrate with Mandy, which... Oh, I saw him. I was already zipping ahead to see what was next by then. I saw him in there, and as... Yeah, the fuck. But wait a minute! I just realized! 
Why is Otis the babyface celebrating with Mandy the heel? Mandy's the babyface. What? Sonya was the heel. Sonya was the one, if I remember right, because we were watching at the time, with Dolph Ziggler, who set it up so that Mandy wouldn't go out with Otis. I forget, you know, I forget how this is all Oh, so I stupid. don't care about that. I'm just, I was just looking at Mandy Rose's fucking stink bitch face and thinking that she was the heel. I don't know. Mandy Rose is the pretty girl, although she's not necessarily what I would look for in a woman, but she's the pretty girl who likes the fat gross guy. So that makes her the baby face. Yeah. All right. Moving along. Any final thoughts? No. Okay. Sonia, enter the Federal Witness Protection Program. Um, the next match, Seth Rollins with his little sidekick buddy versus Dominic Mysterio with his <laughs> little sidekick Ray. And I must admit, when I saw this next, I, this is what I wrote. This is SummerSlam. Two girls matches, a sloppy tag team match, and a single match with a teenage kid in his first match in front of people. This is what SummerSlam has come to. And honestly, they won me over part of the way into this and then started running me back off by the end of it. But I will elaborate. Seth Rollins was great at the start toying with and kind of struggling with and selling for Dominic, but still portraying him as an opponent that was in over his head, right? He, it, it, he got some lucky things and it looked like a struggle when Seth was trying to slow him down a couple of times and it wasn't bad. I think Dominic Mysterio would probably be the third best worker in all elite wrestling. Come um, on, come on. <laughs> well, that's, all right, maybe fourth. That's fourth. Ridiculous. Maybe fourth. That's ridiculous. Uh, <laughs> Dominic was doing all right. It was making sense. Dominic made a nice comeback and wore Seth Rollins out with the kendo stick. I wasn't tired of the kendo stick yet at this point because it, he was getting tit for tat. They did it to him. He should do it to, to them. Then it started. I hate to hurt Seth Rollins' feelings. And I know he's touchy about his feelings. But he hit a top rope superplex that looked like a million dollars and immediately popped up, jerked Dominic up and hit, what, what do they call it, the Falcon Arrow? He didn't even register the superplex. It made the superplex meaningless. This is even worse than the spot they do where they superplex a guy and then the guy that just got superplexed hooks the other guy's legs. This was worse because they both took the superplex bump and Seth popped right up to his feet and fucking gave the other guy the fight. And it's Dominic in his first match and that didn't beat him. I would start finding anybody that doesn't sell a superplex. If you can't take that bump off the top rope and both of you sell it for a minute, fuck it, don't do it. And then Seth wore Dominic out with the stick again. And I'm... St <laughs> The kendo stick is so fucking overdone. And why are, and then later on there were fucking 12 or 15 they brought out. If you're not Japanese, why do you have a kendo stick? Why are there kendo sticks under the fucking ring? I don't, it, then both of them took a bump through the fucking table. And Dominic hit a frog splash for a two count. And then Dominic went out and wandered around and got a chair but slid it in too far, and as he goes in to get it, Seth Rollins gets up and power bombs him. Why make your baby face look like an idiot, unless that wasn't the spot? Did he really shoot that fucking chair all the way across the ring accidentally? Because if not, he could have shoved it in as he went to pick it up. Seth could have done the same thing. I don't know. But then he takes Dominic's shirt off, gets the stick again, beats him up again, and gets handcuffs. Because, of course, this match is no rules and no DQ and anything goes, which is another way of saying lazy booking and lazy fucking plotting. Just let him be able to do everything. Um, you get the handcuffs. Then there comes Dominic's mother or grandmother, as the case may be. And everything comes to a stop. And then Buddy just jumps in and gets on Dominic. And so Ray Mysterio attacks Buddy. 
and they have a big schmoz, and they handcuff Rey Mysterio to the ropes. Is there a referee, I wrote. <laughs> yes, he is. He's standing there doing nothing, because it's just because it's no rules and no disqualification doesn't mean that the referee should not try to stop these things, because then it creates more urgency, as we've talked to so many times in the past. The heels get 15 kendo sticks, and then they suddenly stand there and decide to go after Mama, who's 100 feet away. And everybody instantly panics, because there's no way that this apparently mobile, middle-aged woman <laughs> can get away from these people that are 100 feet away from her. And as they start going that way, then Dominic comes and makes a big comeback. And Seth Rollins stomps, stops him and curb stomps him while Mysterio can't reach him, but it's in front of the referee. This was an angle done as a match, not a match done as a match. This was an, uh, they're, the pieces of a tremendously hot angle are in here. Yes, you handcuffed the father and beat up the son while the father can't. That's an angle to lead to a match. That's not the finish of the fucking match. And then he beat him one, two, three. It, it started really good. Dominic made a real good showing of himself. And then it just gets so far and so contrived and so stagey and, and slow and it, it, just all the milking. Remember, we talked on a recent program. The NWA style was all about get the shit done, make sure everybody sees what you did, but make it look legitimate and don't fucking spend too much time distracting the referee or standing there telegraphing what you're going to do because then it has impact when you do it and it looks more real. And the WWF style has always been stand around forever and milk shit. And it comes from they were in big buildings, 20,000 seat buildings, you got to stand and milk shit. But on TV, up close and personal, with no fans in the building, it's just endless fucking milking and staring and making expressions that the cameras can catch on purpose. Blah. So I like part of this, part of this I didn't. What'd you think? I didn't care for it at all. When you said milking, I had that exact phrase in my mind when he got the handcuffs out. And then very slowly walked across the ring with the handcuffs. I really didn't like this. You know... One of the best matches I've ever seen live was a match you had me attend. Seth, Ru well, Tyler Black versus Austin Aries at the Manhattan Center. Yeah. It was fantastic. I can't say enough good things about it. I have enjoyed his work in the past, but I must admit. I'll, t I'll tell you another one before you make that statement. One that beat that was Tyler Black versus Davey Richards in Toronto. In the summer of, I believe, 2010. I didn't see that, that was, match. Well, it was, it, was, it was on one of the internet pay-per-views, so nobody did. Yeah. But it, it was modern. It was, uh, to me, it was the modern update of Flair and Steamboat. They went as far as they could go, making it an athletic contest and beating the piss out of each other without being obviously cooperating. It was really fucking good. Whatever they've done to him, and I'll go ahead and finish your thought, I don't know either. When we first started watching some of this stuff again, the WWE main roster stuff, we would hear from people that would say, why does Jim give such a free pass to Seth Rollins? And I was like, what are they talking about? I mean, this guy's an incredible talent. The more I see him, the more I don't want to see him. Yeah. Whether it's... I don't like him on the mic and I don't like, I hate to just pick on someone's voice. His voice is irritating. His he, he always had that kind of voice, but if he got mad and was speaking for himself, he had emotion and you could get into it. But now that they've got him purposely being laid back and the Monday night Messiah and what all this, whatever this is, he just doesn't have any oomph. The Monday night Messiah gimmick is shit. I really don't like it. And whatever it is, whether it's him working the WWE style, and again, he was great in the Shield, but the last several months to a year, whatever, however long it's been, the more I see him, the more I want to turn the TV off when I see him. I can't put my finger on exactly what it is, but he's one of the most irritating wrestlers out there <laughs> for me. And, I, and I've seen him. I've seen him have a fantastic match live. One of the best matches I ever saw. But whatever they're doing with him, from the gimmick to his heel personality, this fucking bootleg Brody Lee gimmick, 
with Buddy Murphy as his little disciple. <laughs> it's really bad. I didn't care about this match. It went on forever. It just went on forever and ever. They milked everything. Him, like, taunting Ray. Come on, Ray, do something. I'm thinking, why doesn't Ray get in there and fucking do something? Yeah. Well, he promised his son. I don't care. <laughs> really didn't like this. I have not liked anything with Seth Rollins in quite a while. I hope this could be repaired, but I really, really, really did not like this. Yeah. The end. The end. All right. Well, you know what match was next? I don't remember. Another women's championship match. Now, I must admit that regardless of who it is, men, women, children, dogs, cats, whatever, I zip through the entrances because they take for fucking ever. And I can save time that way on the show. Can you explain to me, Brian, last why Asuka wrestled twice on SummerSlam where that now she wrestled Sasha Banks? Why did they do this? I can't explain to you how it was set up because I have not been watching their TV that much so that I... Understand. Was this advertised? I believe it was advertised that she was going to wrestle both of them because one was the Raw champion, one's the SmackDown champion. Ah. Oh. And they're both the tag team champions. They have all the women's belts on the main roster. The one thing I did think was ridiculous was after the match she had earlier with Bailey, I don't know why Asuka had to do her entire entrance again the way she did before the first match, as if there was no first match, no grueling first match that she didn't win. She came out with the robe and the mask and doing the whole dance again. Nothing against that. But why do it on a show the second time after you did it earlier and then you lost? That I thought was a mistake. Well, I wrote, seriously? Question mark, question mark. And fucking fast forwarded. Now I'm going to have to, there's three girls matches on SummerSlam and one of the girls wrestled twice. So tell me what you thought of this real briefly. I thought it was all right. Asuka won. She won the, I think it's the SmackDown title. I'm not even sure who holds what well, title. Well, that's, you can't even, but just give everybody a belt when they wander in the building. They're obviously teasing dissension between Sasha and Bailey because Bailey wasn't able to save Sasha before she got pinned. I think Sasha and Bailey together are a fantastic act. I'm going to use the word act here. I wish you wouldn't do that. I hate that. I, almost look, almost as much as character. Well, look at what we're watching here. Yeah. And obviously people react to them because when they were on NXT, those were the weeks that NXT had the big bounce. But I just think well, of all the women's matches for you to fast forward, I mean, I guess I can understand why you wanted to watch Mandy versus Sonya. But Asuka's... Oh, no, yeah, not why I wanted to, why I felt I had to. Asuka's very good, though. And so is Bayley and so is Sasha. Well, good. Maybe when they get their shit together, we figure out one belt we can fight over. We'll fucking revisit this. The next match on SummerSlam, two hours into SummerSlam, grown men suddenly appear. This was the first men's match that actually had stars that you would care about two hours into the program for the WWE title, one of the world titles. Orton and Drew McIntyre. And you know, you've said Drew McIntyre has been the 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 victim of the pandemic. Because yep. here was another match that if there had been people, Orton decided to show everybody how to be a heel, and he bailed and stalled and tried to pick his spots, and then when he got heat, he was vicious. Um... Drew McIntyre, they both are tremendous athletes. Orton's got the fucking pedigree. He's been a top star for a long time. They've pushed McIntyre to the moon. I do wish they'd use the ring now and then in the early go. Everybody has to go out on the floor now, even before there was no fans, and it because they've got so much area to play with in the WWF. But um, I thought McIntyre sold his ass off great, and Orton knows how to fucking heal. And a match like this needs the fans to react off of the facials and the body language and the way that they sold and the way that they registered the moves and et cetera to really get into it. Um, and so I think once again, Drew McIntyre, because they actually had the first legitimate 
well-worked pro wrestling match on this program amongst between stars. This is where they're missing the fans. Um, but they beat the piss out of each other. Orton hardweight himself with one of those headbutts. McIntyre was scuffed up on his face. At the end, they went into, they were slow at the beginning, but they went into tons of twists and turns. I, it, again, I can do without the interminable milking before Randy goes for the fucking kick or whatever. But uh, uh, finally, boom, uh, you know, it's it's Orton's fucking punt versus McIntyre's Claymore kick. So McIntyre uh, foiled Orton's punt. Orton ducked McIntyre's kick, and then McIntyre backslid him. It was a good match. The finish got slowed down, but I thought it was a good job by both guys. And it's, you know, it looks like wrestlers having a wrestling match, being stars. I, you know, it just... It looks out of place. What do you think? I thought it was good. I'm really high on McIntyre. Like you said, he's he's been the most unfortunate champion they've ever had because it's been during this period. I was thinking during this match, I hope they keep the belt on him for a year, year and a half. Like, let yeah. him have a long run and establish him for the long term as one of the stars of the company because they need top guys. And I'm just worried they're going to rush the belt off him as soon as the pandemic's over. Well, besides that, they also need top guys from Europe because they'll probably be able to tour there before they'll be able to do it here because, you know, countries with competent leadership have this shit under control. So, you know, they're probably going to be uh, bigger crowds internationally before there are here in this country. So, yeah, they really need Drew McIntyre. And anyway, by by this point in the show, SummerSlam had kind of beaten me down a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> I remember how excited I was for like SummerSlam 89 when I was a kid. And that show went on like three hours, but I never got tired of it. And either did the crowd yeah. at the Meadowlands watching that on video or watching it live on pay-per-view at the time. But by this point, I was tired. I was sick of the Thunderdome. I was just sick. Oh, of it. I, that's and if I was looking for Undertaker versus Under Faker for fuck's sake at this point. <laughs> I would have taken that. And the the people in the seats again, okay, we've had the Panda Bear, we've had the Fire Velveteen Dream, we've had the Chris Benoit, we had the uh, Clan Hood, we had the uh, uh, beheading, the yeah. execution by the terrorists, the beheading in one of this. But basically, it just looks like a bunch of non-HD, poorly framed fucking selfies of all the people in the audience. And it, it and again, it's distracting because these, the audio does the sound sweetening does not obviously come from those people. It's, it, it's busy in the background. It's busy. I don't know. Anyway, um, the only thing left, thank fucking God. The other world title is on the line. Now the fiend versus Braun Strowman for the universal title. Cause everybody's a champion here at championship wrestling folks. Um, and the fiend cup, we used to have matches in less time than these fucking entrances take. I, and, and the, after the swamp fight, whenever that was a month or two ago, I want to see this. Like I want to have a colonoscopy performed by the guy that pumps out my septic tank. Because I, Braun Strowman is rotten, and I hate. I, everybody say, "Oh, you love Bray Wyatt," and the more I see of him, the more I hate it, because of the teleportation and the invulnerability and the fucking the lightning bug funhouse and the goddamn puppets and the fucking stupid shit that. And this, to me, after. I've seen Drew McIntyre and Randy Orton, which they are stars, and especially on this program, they were the only thing that even passed for stars. This was like seeing a Memphis main event. Everybody said, oh, you love Memphis wrestling, Cornette. Well, sometimes when Lawler was booking and he needed an opponent for a Monday night because they had 52 of those a year and he had nobody else, he'd put Duke Myers in a Halloween costume and tell him not to sell anything. And suddenly Lawler versus the Colossus of Death. The problem is Braun Strowman is not Jerry Lawler. You can't get a match out of this horse shit. They immediately bailed out and spent 10 minutes on the fucking floor with sloppy fighting that everybody does. 
in between Braun Strowman hitting the fucking fiend with everything and it doesn't kill him and he never stays down. I figure they don't use the ring because they can't work. Although yeah, I've, I've heard Bray Wyatt can work. Maybe he just can't work with Braun Strowman. I'm pretty sure probably nobody can. I'm pretty sure he can't work. Well, I, I, I don't know. I, all I, I, Braun Strowman would be a nightmare because you, he's too big to, to get him to do anything but his, his own shit. You can't put him where he needs to be. It'd be like working with Andre if Andre didn't know what he was fucking doing. I so agree then, with you, but I've seen Bray Wyatt in there with really talented guys, and I've never seen a great Bray Wyatt. Oh, well, I, was, I, was, I, I wasn't going to argue with you there. Is it? Maybe it was just he can't work. Uh, people have said he can, but people say a lot of things. They they fought to the stage. The Fiend, let me get this straight. The Fiend has been run down with vehicles, right? Fiend has been hit with sledgehammers. Fiend has been squashed under things. I don't think he was buried. That was AJ Styles. But it, the Fiend has had a lot of horrendous things done to him, and he comes right back, right? What the other night, they loaded Bray Wyatt in the ambulance, and he fucking came out seconds later. Braun Strowman rammed the fiend's face into the fucking TV screen on the stage. And he sold that. He was like, and it was like a light ram. Like, we don't want to break this. Oh shit. They fought to the gorilla position. Ladies and gentlemen, that's what the modern day gorilla position looks like. It used to be about 10 feet square with fucking black curtains over a wooden platform with a table, um, two monitors and three chairs. And that's what the gorilla position was in the nineties. Now, it's this giant room that they actually construct that's room for about 20 people, has all these fucking captain's chair, uh, desk chair, nice plush things, a couple of big tables, all these uh, uh, monitors. I think they even pipe air conditioning into it, and there's usually about 20 people there. But since... They had to fight in it. There's nobody in there. And, of course, people didn't know they were coming to the gorilla position. They all just left to take a shit at the same time. Was this a Falls Count Anywhere match? And I didn't realize that. I don't know. Because the referee know. was counting in the gorilla position. Counted a fall. Uh, then they went back out to the stage. Braun Strowman was trying to sell. I noted that he had hard way color from something. And the pace of this match was now glacial. I predict that it would take approximately 747 million years of this match to create the Grand Canyon. There's a reason Bruiser Brody and Abdullah the Butcher didn't go 30 minutes. This is it. If you're going to be two fucking big guys that's going to have a fucking fight, get in and get out before they can see through it. They had an AEW moment. Did you see that Braun Strowman was so mad at the Fiend that he punched the mat beside the Fiend's head six times right in a row? I did see that, yes. They just think this is okay now. They don't even realize they're on television. Somebody said, well, it was the director's fault when the fucking Lucha brother was doing it on AEW the other day when he was punching his own arm instead of the guy's head. Well, it's the director's fault. The director expects that the fucking wrestlers, if they're on television, know how to work by this point, which in AEW is a drastic over-assumption. But you would think that they, at this point, by the, in the WWE, they'd be able to, no, no. Just punch the fucking mat next to his head. One of the announcers said something, and he's hammer-fisting him. Anyway, then... <sighs> Braun Strowman goes back out on the floor, ladies and gentlemen, and he calmly walks over to the toolbox that they've used before. He gets the box cutter. He's now got a razor sharp box cutter in his hand. And there's no rules to this. And he's got an invulnerable supernatural opponent. So instead of just cutting his fucking throat with the box cutter, he sliced the canvas and the padding off the ring and, and tore and pulled it up. They had to find them a Mac daddy of a box cutter, first of all, to cut those goddamn canvases. And secondly, that fucking padding is pretty thick, too. I, they, it didn't look like they used the normal padding they use. It looked like they used the old styrofoam stuff that would cut easier because they have this 
this fucking shit that we used to get in OVW, it's like an inch thick, but you can drop an egg on it from six feet high and it won't fucking break. It's very shock absorbing, but it's thick. So anyway, somewhere or another, he slices up the canvas and the pad, turns it up. He's going to slam the fiend on the exposed, unforgiving wood of the ring structure. But since he's turned his back on his opponent forever, the guy that is impossible to kill that comes back from every goddamn major injury, he just decides after he puts him down after one bump, he's going to go out, get in the toolbox, get this thing, slice up the fucking ring, pull all this shit up, take some time, and when he turns around, Brian, wouldn't you know who won the pony? Guess who's standing there looking at Braun Strowman? The Fiend. Back on his feet. And then the fiend gives Braun Strowman a rotten rock bottom, a rotten bottom. I don't know. It's because Strowman was so big and heavy. He can't get up. He was blowed up, whatever the fuck it was. This was rotten. And then two of the most awkward sister Abigail's on the wood ever, probably again, because Strowman is 380 pounds and he can't move him around. And he's so what the fuck and giving him that goddamn move. It just, it looked like a monkey fucking a football. And then he beat him one, two, three flat as fuck. And Braun Strowman looks even more like a meat headed dumb fuck than he ever has before for the way that he lost without even an out. Without even an out, just beat your baby face flat in the middle and make him look stupid right before you do it. <sighs> so, when I thought it couldn't get any worse, it didn't get any worse because it couldn't, but Roman Reigns hit the ring and tackled the fiend and beat the shit out of him and then speared Braun Strowman and then hit him with eight. I will say full force. It wasn't full force. Eight hard chair shots across the back. The first few were pretty stiff, and then he caught on that he can hit the fucking floor on the other side of Strowman and bend the back of the chair, and it won't be as bad as fucking hitting Strowman. But not one good safe, not Roman Reigns coming in, spearing the fucking fiend. Boom, knocking him out of his boots. Spearing fucking Braun Strowman. He rolls to the floor, hit a big move on the fiend, lay him out, roll out to the floor, grab a chair, one good safe shot to the fucking head. Boom. Down goes fucking the fiend, or not, not the fiend, but Braun Strowman. And then stand there and get your glory. Eight fucking shots to the back like that? I don't want a motherfucker hitting me with a chair that hard eight times. I want one shot to the head by somebody that knows how to give it to me because I know how to take it, and I'll sell it. Eight fucking shots to the back. What the fuck? Like, the, like it's safe to hit you in the back with a metal chair. They quit doing... The, the one shot to the head that would knock you out and everybody knows it and that's why you can get away with selling it like that and it, people who know how to do it to let everybody beat each other over the back unmercifully full force with the same fucking chair. It's the stupidest goddamn... So anyway, then he speared the fiend again. If the fiend had been up to his feet after fucking Roman Reigns, my goddamn major top baby face speared him and beat the shit out of him before I'd have fired the fucking fiend. They just can't, they have to do too much. They can't do it any other way. They can't make shit mean anything. They just have to beat you literally over the head with everything. My last line on these notes, I couldn't delete this show fast enough. Great that Roman Reigns is back. You want to have a you? You didn't watch uh, this on, you ordered the pay-per-view? You didn't watch this on the network? I wasn't going to sit here in front of my fucking computer for that long. I was in my goddamn recliner on watching my 82 inch to make it more palatable. But anyway, what'd you think of that last one? It sucked. You know, it sucked. <laughs> you know, there's nothing I could say to shine that one up. It was garbage. I don't want to see either one of those guys anymore. I don't want to see this feud anymore. How did it not end 
with Braun Strowman being drowned in the swamp. That's what, yeah, that's what I was going to say. They, were, they fought in a fucking swamp and one guy got drowned. And then they come back and have a fucking match. Talk about following a shooting with a stabbing. For fuck's sake, they, th- there's no sense of pacing. All the goofy writers just get goofy ideas and pitch them to the goofy talent, and then the goofy talent says, oh, we can do this, and then they don't have any fucking concept. They don't go from one place to another by the direct route. They're all over the fucking pay- page. I, ju- I don't... This does not resemble the profession that I spent 40 years in, So, and, and it's it, it's not that hard. It shouldn't be this hard. They got they got fucking they got tools and material. They got no goddamn carpenters. On the bright side, it's nice to see Roman Reigns back. Hope he's happy and healthy. On well, the bright side, as Lawler once said one time, it's nice to see Roman Reigns is back, especially after seeing his front. I guess he came back with all new teeth. Maybe that's why he was gone Did so he? long. Yeah, apparently he has all new teeth which I later saw Randy Orton made fun of him about on social media. I I didn't know his teeth were bad. I think they were fine, but now they're like just perfect white, ready for the movies, like just perfect fake teeth. Uh, Another bright side of the show, at least we didn't see the Ninja Army come and mess with the broadcast, although maybe if they had shut off the broadcast, it would have been a positive. They would have turned them into the biggest babyface group in history <laughs> if they'd have shut this fucking broadcast off. I, yeah, that's what they should. They should have had a shot from the back of the master switch, the big fucking switch on the wall, and had the goddamn ninja going, we're going to do it, we're going to do it, and everything go black. Fuck. Anyway, so that was the second biggest show of the year. I, there's there, <laughs> What a there, year there, it's been. There's talent out there. Yes, you can't have people in the building. There's talent out there. Certainly better than what we saw here in some cases on this program. There are ways to make people care about talent. I have uh, enumerated a number of them off the top of my head just after watching this fucking fiasco. They have the ta- they have the tools and they have the material and they don't have anybody that can fucking build this thing and put it together. I just I it's <laughs> It's not that fucking difficult. It it's it's difficult to really do it right and make a million fucking dollars, but it's not difficult to just do it right and be better than this. Just off the top of my head, all the oh good lord. Anyway, but they're all stars as seen on television. So what are we going to see on TV this with, with Sunday, Monday for the drive through? This coming Monday, the last day of the month of August, uh, then we're going to compare NXT from Wednesday to AEW from Thursday because we didn't want to do NXT on this show. Then we're comparing apples and oranges. We were keeping with the head up rivalry. Is that what we're doing? Yeah. Funny enough, after this WWE pay-per-view event, that's going to be a palate cleanser for WWE, AEW and NXT. God, if we've come this far that actually we get a bad taste out of our mouth by watching AEW and NXT. It makes you understand a little bit about why people are so gaga over AEW. Beyond the people that just like that style of wrestling, those style of matches, with just nonstop high spots and no one sells anything, there's an audience for that. But there's also an audience that has been watching WWE and having WWE insult them for years that I could understand why they are so happy about AEW. After spending any time watching a WWE broadcast and their commentators and the production and the camera switches on every move and everything being milked. And the herky-jerky zooms. And guys you don't want to see anymore and guys that are shoved down your throat. I understand why some people just... Don't want to hear anything negative about AEW. They they need it. They want to will it to succeed. So, the, so fuck that electric chair. We're going for the gas chamber. So I guess that. I can. I guess I can see the point. But we, and we found out last week on Saturday nights. What was it? Seven hundred and seventy something thousand folks. So that's one thing we mentioned on last week's program. One of the first things I learned in the business when you change your day of your house show 
to a different day of the week, that hurts. But when you change your TV time, that hurts even worse. But I said I mentioned that the I was one of the hardcore fans that not like the casual fans might just miss it, but I would make sure to see the show no matter when it was on, what time of day or night, and that's where you know you got your base. It appears to me that almost everybody watching AEW is their base. 750, 800,000. They'll get a few, but they have a few uh, more the other night when they were against NXT, probably because there's more wrestling fans in general watching television at that time and they're bopping back and forth as we've talked about. But these people are incredibly loyal, and that is the number of them. And if they put them on Tuesday morning at one o'clock, they're probably still going to do six, seven hundred thousand fucking people. And the question is, will anybody, can anybody take that horse shit seriously enough to build outside that audience, even to the rest of the current wrestling audience? Because Raw is still two million or thereabouts, SmackDown, whatever. It's gotten that bad, that low, but they're still there. So, but we know that AEW's base is going to be there no matter what time they're on. And we also pretty much at this point know that's how many there are. Would you would you agree with that? For the most part, yeah. So we'll see what and and when they go back head to they've they've got a couple of weeks, even if their time is the one that's being switched, AEW has a few weeks unopposed at different times to do something to hook some other people that normally watch NXT. And I guarantee goddamn to you that they will not do that. Because the only people watching that show are the people who already want to see that kind of fucking wrestling. It's not going to spread. This is not a mainstream appeal product. A bunch of kids playing wrestler. You're getting the audience of the people who would love to play wrestler if they got the opportunity and would be probably a, approximately the same level workers if they got the opportunity. You're not getting the wrestling fans that wanted to see the stars fight. So we'll see what happens. I think it's also the other way. This is NXT's big chance to win over some people who have been only watching AEW or choose AEW over them. They've had a lot of dry shows with one or two highlights. NXT should right now be doing everything they can to make it so that when it's Wednesday head to head once again, people say, you know, I want to see AEW, but I can't miss this NXT show. Well, the guys seem willing to work hard. They just need somebody to book it for them instead of a bunch of fucking comedy writers that graduated from major universities with a degree in being pussies. If I would suggest you get three or four people that have been in a variety of fucking fights with people and goddamn tell them how to fucking create some conflict because these fucking pussy fucking comedy writers with their goddamn diplomas on their fucking wall are whistling stranger in paradise and always will be. You can't fucking, I won't even get started. Are we done here? You bet. All right. This coming week on the drive through uh, NXT from Wednesday and AEW from Thursday. Next week on the experience, who the fuck knows? We got to check the schedules, folks. We don't know what we're going to talk about, but it will obviously be of, of interest to you. So until then, for Brian and the rest of the Hee Haw gang, I'm Jim. Thank you. Fuck you. And bye-bye SummerSlam.